Texas is back. Was there any other way that I could possibly launch this show and relaunch this channel, but by saying Texas is back? They certainly look back to me coming all the way to a college football playoff appearance last year, taking Washington down to the wire, winning the Big 12 championship. It's off to the SEC, and they certainly looked stocked and loaded to give it a go here for all the glory, all the marbles, all the championships in the SEC and nationally here in 2024. Welcome in, everyone, to the Voice of College Football. We appreciate you stopping by. As always, your, your presence here, your contribution here is never taken for granted. We appreciate you being here. Leave those comments and questions there in the chat. Consider the Super Chat contribution as well. We are launching a Texas-sized party to get our Texas show jump-started here on Monday nights. This will be our day and time going forward with myself and Matthew Miller. That's each and every Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m., of course, where it counts, Austin, Texas, and the entire state of Texas sitting in the central time zone, 6 p.m. Eastern time for all of you Make it a time that you join us. Let's make it a date every Monday, 6 Central Time for Texas Live. This we are now calling Horns Huddle. And uh, we will be delivering Texas football talk for you each and every week. So this is the launch party that is going to last for however long we go. So we do have some fine guests standing by ready to take part. Uh, tonight, including Fanatic Perspective, we've got Andrew Miller from Hook'em Headlines, Nick Battle from Nino's Corner, and we hope to be joined by the folks from On Texas as well. Of course, uh, we've got an SEC channel as well, which is part of this fun. And uh, tonight we are simulcasting. We're on the Texas channel. We're on the national channel. We, at some point, will move this away from the national channel and be exclusively on Monday nights on the Texas channel. So now is the time to lock in on all that we do. Uh, we will see a lot from Matthew Miller. We will see a lot from Sonny Verma in the upcoming months leading into the Texas 2024 season in a quest for a national championship for the first time since 2005. So again, we appreciate Matthew Miller who has held down the Texas live show for quite some time, about 40 to 45 weeks at this point. I'm going to help Matthew out throughout the summer, get this baby cranked up and deliver the best Texas football that we can put together. And again, Sonny Verma, who posted uh, a Texas personnel move uh, just a few days ago, please check out the video here on the Texas channel. So again, you might be joining us on the main channel or you might be on the Texas channel, but please subscribe to our Texas Longhorns channel. Of course, to get us started here in the chat, Jackson Johnson. Thank you so much, Jackson. Jackson reminding everyone, please use the Amazon link in the description section of all the videos. Here's the deal. The Amazon link it's completely transparent to you, doesn't cost you a penny, and you help support the channel here at the Voice of College Football. I bought four or five items from Amazon just the other day, and guess what? I was just about to click checkout. I was just about to go to the checkout, had my cart filled, and I forgot to use the Amazon link. So guess what I did? I went back out, I used the Amazon link, and as soon as I clicked on the Amazon link, it was like I never left the link that I started, the link, the just standard Amazon link. It was exactly the same. All my items were still saved, were still in the cart. I was still logged in. It's absolutely transparent, folks. Please use the Amazon link in the description section of all the videos. It does not cost you a penny, but it's your one way to contribute to the Voice of College Football without spending a penny. So thank you for the reminder Jackson. And again, it's Texas football talk here for the next couple hours. Uh, Matthew, unfortunately, has been delayed, but never fear. Matthew will be here, we believe, in the next 10 or 15 minutes. 
YouTube channel membership and also a Patreon membership. It basically gets you the same perks here at the Voice of College Football. So you can subscribe to both. Certainly you are uh, encouraged to do that. But uh, one or the other will suffice. Either become a YouTube channel member here on the main national channel or over on Patreon for all that you see there. Exclusive live streams, watch parties, predictions, and more. My predictions would have made you 4500 bucks last year against the spread at $100 per clip. Not bad. My straight up picks uh, money line would have made you about $4,500 for the entire football season and beyond. Okay. But thank you for that. Uh, Jackson, of course, the Texas spring game is coming up this Saturday. I believe that's at 3 p.m. Eastern time and 2 central. I don't know who has the Texas spring game. We will look into that, of course, with Matthew and with our guests. And we'll let you know what we have prepared to deliver for you in terms of Texas post game. If you check this out this past Saturday night, you know that I went live after all the day's festivities across the nation were wrapped up for a bring big spring game post show uh, with most of the SEC in play, Ohio State and others, Miami on this past Saturday. So please check that out if you have yet to join us there. We will do something similar this Saturday with Michigan on the field at noon Eastern time. We will go live following the Michigan spring game. We will also go live later in the day once everything is wrapped up and possibly have a separate USC post game live as well. We shall see. That's one of the reasons why you subscribe. Hit that bell for the notifications to know when we go live and also check out uh, our community post each and every day. That's got the complete schedule to everything here at the Voice of College Football. Joey checking in from West Virginia Territory. The Mountaineers coming off a 9-4 and four season looking good for this year. And we do appreciate everyone being here. Be patient, please. We appreciate your patience. A uh, few people are late, but uh, we will crank it up here with Texas Football Talk. There's a few guys in particular that are common names to me that I am curious about concerning uh, Texas performance in the transfer portal. They picked up two big Alabama transfers, actually three from Tuscaloosa Two, really all three are, are pretty fine football players. Of course they signed at Alabama. They, they have talent. Uh, Amari Nyblack, the tight end coming in from Alabama. Everyone talking about Isaiah bond and what he can do at wide receiver for Texas. And then, of course, the linebacker coming in, Kendrick Blackshire from Alabama. Also, Silas Bolden, wide receiver from Oregon State. Matthew Golden, the wide receiver from Houston. Another big pickup. Two more on the defensive side of the ball for Texas. Of course, the edge rusher, one of the best in the portal. Edge rusher, Trey Moore from Texas San Antonio. And Andrew Makuba one of the best safeties in the ACC who left Clemson to come play for Sark. And that's pretty much the Texas story on that side of the football in regards to, or in, in terms of transfer portal additions, losses to the portal. As we discussed, uh, just posted a few days ago by our guy, Sonny Verma, the loss of Samaj A. Burrell, linebacker, leaves Texas, goes to the transfer portal. And again, on a Tuesday, the floodwaters will be <laughs> blasting through the floodgates of the transfer portal, we anticipate. Some 2,300 players have been in the transfer portal since last August. That's the statistic I saw today. That doesn't seem like it could be possible, does it? If there are 
Mm. Well, there are 100 players on 130 teams. That's about 13,000 players. Sure, it could be possible because that also includes guys that have left for the NFL or run out of eligibility. So that's probably 15 or 16,000 players. 2,300 have been in the portal since last August. And there are estimates that that number is going to exceed 3,000, meaning it's going to go from 2,300, an additional 700 on Tuesday. 700 players already see one prominent player out of Penn State, Keandre Lambert Smith, has made his intentions known. He was not at Penn State spring practice uh, for the last week, and so there was much speculation, and that speculation turned out to be true. So the transfer portal uh, is something we will be all over. So this is what we're doing this week. We will be live every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Eastern time on the national channel, going through all the transfer portal news. And please join us each and every day. Let's uh, get right to it. Uh, we got our guy Nick Battle showing up here from Nino's Corner. Nick, what's going on today? Hey, Mark. What's going on, man? It's going pretty well. Appreciate you stopping by. Yeah, man, most definitely. We are just uh, talking nothing but Texas here for a few hours. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is heaven for you. Heaven, heaven, heaven. Yes, sir. Yes, and, sir. And you're, you're part of it. You are a big part of it. So we, we do appreciate your, your analysis and you dropping by. Uh, Nick's got a great thing going there. Again, it's Nino's Corner. It's right here on YouTube. And we will have the uh, banner up here in just a second that you can track Nick immediately over there at Nino's Corner. What have you posted there recently? Nothing too much yet, man. I'm going to do something tonight. You know, so we just had just a couple guys hit the portal today, you know, so, you know, we'll see how, you know, just the stuff, you know, just actually shakes out with the depth chart, you know, so Peyton Kirkland, um, you know, so he's a, 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 a backup tackle, you know, so he just hit the portal today. And also I think it was Billy Walton, you know, so he's a, um, a, a end. Yeah. So with the portal opening on Tuesday, where do you think they'll go in terms of positions? Or if you've got specific players, certainly give those to us. Uh, and, and where do you think they should target? I think Texas should honestly target the defensive line. You know, I don't know about the players per se yet, uh, but Texas definitely needs to shore up just the interior line. You're looking at guys that they lost over the last two years. You know, you had Coburn, you know, um, you know, well, yes, yeah, so he was two years ago. And then this year you got Sweat leaving and, you know, and, and, and also Murphy as well. Right. So those two guys leaving, we got to have some war daddies. Right. We got to, you know, you know, like just have a line that can stop the run in Texas. Yeah, you know, we got, um, you know, Collins here now. We got Broughton as well, but we just got to figure out who is going to be that war daddy in the line. One of the best uh, rush defenses in college football last year. Most definitely. Uh, but some really good guys obviously uh, leave and, uh, Sweat should be a first round pick, correct? Uh, I would say possibly third round or so. Okay. He, you know, so Murphy's going to be the first round pick. You know, he's a okay. he's a dog. He's an animal. You know, so just looking at the mock drafts, it's looking like he's going to be you know probably anywhere between nine and like twenty. While we're there with the NFL draft, who else do you see there? Of course, people are going to be curious about Xavier Worthy after what he showed at the combine. Yeah. Uh, so kind of take us through the, the Texas uh, draft eligible players and who should go where. Oh, draft's going to be awesome, man. I think Texas has the potential to probably have, you know, hopefully up to four guys in the first round. I mean, there's there's a potential for that. I wouldn't say it's going to happen. I would say possibly three. We know that Byron Murphy's going to go in the first round. I think he's probably, I would say, like the only lock here for Texas to go in that first round. You know, but Mitchell, Mitchell coming in from Georgia, you know, coming to Texas last year. He's a hell of a wide receiver. There's a lot of teams that need wideouts right now. It's very heavy in the first part of the draft. You know, you got you know, Harrison. Um, you got uh, you got the kid from LSU. Um, you got Rome Blake also. Davis. Yeah, man. So you got those three guys. I think those are probably like the criminal crop. You know, but look, I love A.D. Mitchell. Um, and there are some teams in the back of that draft that need wide receivers. Look at the Bills. You know, so the Bills just got rid of Diggs, right? And so they're going to be in the market for wide receiver. Um, you know, the Chiefs as well. 
you know, all the stuff that's going on with Rice right now, the Chiefs need another wide receiver. So, look, um, Worthy, Mitchell, those guys could easily sneak into the, you know, the uh, the uh, the actual laugh has that first round. Are you an NFL guy? Yeah, I am. I am. Who do you root for? I'm a Cowboy fan. I'm okay. a Cowboy fan. Hey, we need a lot of help. We need a lot of help. <laughs> I remember that from our previous conversations. I remember that now. Cowboys. All right. Yeah, we need a lot of help. It we- makes sense. That's, that's going to be easy. Texas guy that would root for the Cowboys as well. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this is all about what's in front of Texas for 2024. Obviously, they're getting commits right now for 2025. We're talking NFL draft. It's all forward thinking. But just curious on your take of the lack of, especially at certain position, it's been alarming. And I think you've addressed it in regards to offensive line. The NFL draft selections for a program that is recruited as well. And this is not Sark's responsibility. This is only his third cycle. Yeah. But uh, in regards to what's happened in the last 10 to 15 years. Oh, yeah. The offensive line has been, you know, just as far as the draft has been horrible for Texas. I think, you know, this year is going to start to change. You're going to see a guy like Christian Jones probably get picked in the top, I would say, 150 picks or so. And this is a guy that if I'd have told Texas fans that Christian Jones was going to be drafted in, you know, third or fourth round, you know, like two years ago, people would have laughed at me. Uh, But that just shows you how good of a coach that Cal Flood is. Um, You know, but Texas is not, uh, you know, had it when it comes to the offensive line. We had the Connor Williams, you know, he was here. Um, you know, the uh, Cosmes, but other than that, it's been kind of hit or miss. Uh, Texas, I'm telling you, man, next year is where things are going to change. Uh, I think Kelvin Banks Jr. has the potential to be the first tackle off the board next year. Um, you got a guy like DJ Campbell, who's a hell of a guard. If he, de- you know, if if he does well this year, he's probably going to be gone too as well. You're looking at guys that are in that pipeline now, a big Cam Williams, what, six foot six or six foot seven, about 360 pounds with great feet. Uh, Cal Flood and Sark are building a hell of an offensive line. Um, and, you know, so I think that's going to change greatly here. What do you want to see Saturday? I want to see the defensive line. All right. I, I I think we already know what the offensive line is going to be like. You know, you got to return in uh, what we got four guys returning this year. Um, so it, it's going to be an awesome offensive line. I think it's a defensive line, you know, losing sweat, losing Byron Murphy. That's going to be something that's going to be hard to overcome. Um, I don't need a lot. I don't think Texas fans need to have the, you know, that that same kind of production. We would love it, uh, you know, but I think Texas fans are pretty, you know, keen to to what we had last year. You know, we got two guys that are going to go in the first three rounds this year at, you know, at that line. Uh, so if Collins and Broughton can bring it on and then you got, um, you know, a, a, a actual addition here from the portal, um, you know, the edge is coming on to us well this year. We got Two brand new edges. Edges was something that was lacking last year when it came to sacks. You know, but this year, you know, having like a Trey Moore come in, which is going to be, I think, fruitful here for Texas. Colin Simmons, national top, what, five player in the country last year, five-star guy. You know, and then you couple that with Ethan Burke. You couple that with, um, you know, Baron Sorrell. I think we're going to have something pretty nasty on the edges this year too as well. Nick, we know you're a serious football guy when you focus on the defensive line in terms of what you want to see on Saturday because even some fairly serious college football fans, if they're not Texas fans, they, they want to see that guy with the the, the last name of Manning, see what he's <laughs> going to look like, to either say, oh, he's overhyped, or to say, hey, why don't they give him a shot? Why, why isn't he starting this year? One or the other. Look, um, Texas fans, you know, Every every fan base loves the new shiny toy, right? And and I think every fan base thought that as soon as Manning got here on campus, that he was going to come in and wow everybody and start immediately. Uh, but those were the Texas teams are old, and that's what got us in trouble. We were always waiting for some freshman to come save us, right? And so Texas fans, we had a quarterback last year that got us to 12-1 and one and won the Big 12 championship for the first time in forever. We go to the college football playoffs with Quinn and – we didn't play our best game, but the game came down to the last play. Like, we did not play our best game at all last, last year. Uh, so we got an experienced Quinn Ewers. Uh, I think he's going to have great strides this year. Uh, Sark is, you know, coaching him for his third year now. And, I, look, I, I expect Quinn to jump off the page this year. It's going to open the door here for, you know, Arch to come in and start the, pre, what, the, the next season. Um, so we have two years in this system. Um, so, yeah. 
Texas fans, calm down. We got a guy who's, you know, one of the top three favorites here for Heisman Trophy this year. Um, he had a hell of a season last year, and I think we're just kind of scratching just how good Quinn can be. We got Nick Battle here from Nino's Corner. We appreciate Nick being here and head on over right here on YouTube to Nino's Corner. Check out uh, Nick's work. Of course, you got the Texas Spring Game coming up on Saturday. Our guy Jackson here, uh, Nick, is talking about Texas, Texas A&M, the big rivalry there. Can't Texas, wait for Arkansas, it. I'll get back together. Do you care about these rivals? Oh, I love them. You know, okay. I'm a Texas grad. So, you know, I went to damn near every home game. Um, I went to some Texas a &M games, you know, at Cal Field and, um, you know, uh, you know, um, at the time, Arkansas wasn't in the conference anymore, but they came and played us. They had Matt Jones, I think, at the – yeah, yeah, it was Matt Jones that year. Um, you know, so they came and beat us in Texas. I was at that game, but I think we went and beat them, like, the next year. So, yeah, those rivalries matter. And even though we don't play Arkansas a lot, when we went to go play Arkansas, you know, in Sark's first year, I mean, it was cutthroat. I had friends that went to Arkansas that were calling me talking mess and – yeah, it it gets down and dirty. I am so excited Texas is in the SEC to get those look with A and M back in the schedule, Arkansas back in the schedule. It just makes sense. Nick, we'll let you go here in a second, but uh, I kidded you a couple of weeks ago when we got together. Nick and I check out the videos we uh, put together. Uh, appreciate Nick uh, running through the offense position by position for us. But uh, that that <laughs> had this transition, this move to the SEC happened any sooner. I don't know that it would have looked real pretty. Oh, no. <laughs> this is the perfect time. This is the perfect time for Texas. Uh, you know, in the previous two staffs, they they didn't look at shoring up the offensive line. The offensive line, like I told you, Mark, um, the five years prior to Sark getting here at Texas, um, it was tied dead last with um, offensive line commitments in the Big 12 tied with Kansas. So that ought to tell you exactly what Texas was looking at from an offensive line standpoint. Um, so when Sark gets in, uh, well, you know, well, first off, the the previous five years, Texas had 12 commitments that were still on that roster from um, from the uh, the uh, two staffs previously. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, 18, 18 total in a, in a five years. Uh, Sark gets in, and in two years, brings in 12. Uh, so, you know, he is short up that line and he's brought in some blue chip guys and we brought in the depth. And so having that depth and having a guy like Cal Flood come in, who I think is the best line coach in the country. We saw what he did at Alabama. We saw how Bama's line has looked since he's not been there. We saw what he did with the Falcons. And now we're seeing what he's doing at Texas and just seeing how good Texas line has been since he's gotten here. It's going to have, you know, in his first, what, three years, going to have, you know, probably three or four guys drafted, which is something that Texas hasn't had in a long time. Um, yeah, so Texas shorting up that offensive line was was outstanding. Kudos to Sark. You know, he he did a great job on that. And it's only looking better here for the future. We got a lot of people in the pipeline that actually want to come in Texas here. And, you know, look, good things are coming for Texas, man. Uh, Nick, do you have any more time for us? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I got okay, some more time. OK, we, we've we got uh, Matthew joining us here. Matthew Miller. Appreciate Matthew jumping on board. Of course, Matthew's the guy that makes this all work for us on the Texas channel with the Texas live show for us. And, and I just uh, enjoy when I can get uh, two experts on a particular team together. So Matthew, I've asked all the rudimentary kind of <laughs> surface level questions. You guys can dice it up a little bit and we can learn about Texas football. So Matthew, I'll let you cut loose. No, um, he hit on a good point. Just what I caught of the offensive line. I think when Steve Sarkeesian got here, we had like 17 scholarship wide receivers and yes. we had less offensive linemen than that. So that's what Steve Sarkeesian has done. And I've used the same thing that Josh Pate said. Texas has always had the ornaments. We've never had the Christmas tree. And we finally <laughs> have the Christmas tree, guys. Like he's built this thing from the ground up and that's the way you had to do it. And I think the like he said in a couple interviews, you either have to come in there and do it your way or you're going to repeat the mistakes of the past. And he just tore that thing down. That's why he went five and seven that first year. But he built a culture. He built it with the offensive line. He's building it with the defensive line. I don't think the defensive line has quite the depth of the offensive line. Um, I think we're going to miss Murphy and Sweat this year. But the offensive line, honestly, I think we're seven, eight deep there. Like if we have one or two injuries, we could sustain that. I'm not going to say we're going to be as good. But can we be 90% of what we are with our starting unit? I definitely think we can. So I definitely agree with Nick's point there. Yeah, man, I'm excited. This line, you know, this was one thing that, 
this was Texas's biggest weakness, you know, once Sark got here, was the offensive line. It was his biggest weakness. And we were trying to, you know, patch up with Band-Aid work. And, you know, our first season was was bad in the line. It was bad. Um, you know, and once we get that second season, we get a Kelvin Banks to come in. He starts from the jump. I mean, he's just a freak of nature, though, that, that usually doesn't happen. Uh, but, you know, he was a, you know, a monster, a true freshman coming in at left tackle and just doing his thing. But also having a guy like Cole Hudson who came in and started a ton at guard. And now, you know, if you see that Cole Hudson's second year, he didn't start at all. You know, we had DJ Campbell come in who was a five star. And so if you have a guy who started 12 games as a freshman and he's your swing guy, I mean, that just shows you just the depth. And he's actually competing for time at the at the left guard position, also center position as well. So uh, Cal Flood has done a great job of cross training all these guys. And once these guys do leave like a Hayden Connor next year and, you know, um, you know, Kelvin Banks Jr., we got guys in the pipeline like a Cole Hudson who's going to step up, a Brandon Baker, um, Chapman, you know, Trevor, Trevor Goosby. Yeah. Goosby is getting a lot of love at that left tackle position. Uh, so Texas is doing their thing. You know, Cruz coming in as a freshman who is probably going to compete really well for that center job next year. So, hey, man, we're we're set up really well here on the line. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, there's a good chance from that first class that Sark brought in. You have four out of five guys playing significant amount of time this year. So and I think Kelvin Banks, if he just keeps what he's doing, the pace that he's going at, he's going to be a first round pick. And that will be the first first round pick in like over a decade Texas oh, had on the offensive line, which is just crazy to think about. We can't have one first round pick on the offensive line in the last decade, which is I think crazy. The, it, it might be longer than that. I think. The yeah, last, I think it is. Yeah, I think the last first round draft pick Texas has had on the offensive line was Mike Williams. And if I'm not mistaken, that was 2000 and I was still in college. So 2003, 2004. Wow. Yeah, I think that was the last first round draft pick on the offensive line. Yeah. And so hey, Sark's cleaned it up a lot. It's cleaned it up a lot. Well, it's, uh, we, we will do our best. Quentin, <laughs> hang right there. We'll see if we can uh, configure the stream yard so we're not uh, knocking people off line here. But, uh, let me throw this one at you, Nick, and then I'll let you guys continue the conversation. And, and I asked you about Sark the last time we talked, and you defended his USC and Washington stints, especially the Washington it's stint. Washington, yeah. Uh, but in terms of him taking over Texas, going five and seven the first year, blowing all those second half leads, and then eight and five was pretty lackluster, and they might have been better than that, really, in terms of away from the win loss record. But at what point did you? No, okay. He he proved it to me. Whether it was a game, a decision, whatever it was that you thought, okay, I, I know that he can win championships. I'm gonna say, you know, the first season was rough. Five and seven was rough, right? It was rough. Um, but you know, me being a Texas guy, you know, I knew the talent he was given, right? And so you kind of knew the cards he was dealt with. You know, nothing bad about, you know, Casey Thompson. You know, you know, he was our starting quarterback. He transfers. He goes to Nebraska, does not look good in Nebraska. Then he goes down to FIU or FAU, one of the two, and didn't look good there either. Right. So it, it kind of shows that, you know, he had Casey Thompson, I think, as a as like a second team, all big 12, you know, guy. So that right there kind of let me know, like, Sark's a hell of a quarterback guy. You know, he you know, he had Casey looking really good in this offense. Um, uh, I think it was the second season. In second season, Quinn starting um, probably the OU game. We go up big. We end up losing the game, right? Uh, you know, X had a drop or whatever, and he comes over to X, and he's like, hey, put your head up. I'm coming right back to you, <laughs> right? And so he just gave him like that, just a hell of a confidence. And, you know, Texas came and made it a hell of a game. You know, Texas didn't win the game. Uh, but, it, you know, I think that was the moment I was like, he's a player's coach. He's an X and O's coach. The kids love them, and I'm seeing the product, you know, increase and get better each year. Um, so I thought after that second year and then getting that huge class he got in with the Kelvin Banks coming in and the DJ Campbells, he got a great class coming in. And I said, if if if, if he can develop these players um, and have these guys at a level that Texas fans have been seeing these guys play for three or four years and we've never seen that out of some of these guys – you know, like he got Coburn drafted, right? Him and Bo Davis getting him, you know, having a guy like Ojimo, he got drafted too to the Eagles. You know, these were guys that we thought were good players, 
Um, but they had really underachieved at Texas. But you start to see his staff develop players and that that offensive line started to get developed. The third year is what really got me. I was like, look, man, we're going bananas right now. The offensive line looks great. The defensive line, I mean, you know, Sweat was one of those guys who we always kind of knew had the talent, but could anybody get it out of him? And last year they got every ounce of whatever he had in him out of him. And Murphy was always my favorite player. I got old podcasts that say, you know, I thought he was pound for pound the best player on the team. And people laughed at me. He's going to be the first – you know, long hearted, it, you know, like in two weeks. Uh, so, you know, I always said he was the pound for pound best player in the team. Um, so to see them ooze out all the talent that they had last year too as well, and to not have the secondary that they want and to still be able to win games, right? And so um, I thought second year, I was like, we got something good, right? You know, Sark's going to be a guy I think can win about 10 games every year. Now, can he put it to the next level and can we compete for championships? And the third year, he proved it. Quentin, we appreciate you being here, man. Fanatic uh, perspective. Yeah, great to be on, guys. I appreciate you having me. I am uh, going to throw you the same question. And then, like I mentioned, when uh, Matthew and Nick jumped on, I'd rather get out of the way and learn from you three and let you guys really get into it. Uh, were you sold on Sark? Did you think that was a good hire, number one? Did you like the hire? Number two, when did he sell you? So I feel like I got to be honest here. I am, uh, I'm here as a draft guy and I am a Texas tech red Raider. Oh. So oh. For, uh, <laughs> from that okay. standpoint, I got you know, it. I, I was like, Oh yeah. Same old UT coach. Sark. Like it'll be great. You know, <laughs> just keep rolling the same thing forward. But okay. I'll be honest though, too. He kind of sold me with some of the stuff he was doing with the offense last year, where they got to it with the playoff, and they they started to really find some success. That as a as a rival fan base, I was kind of like, man, I didn't think they'd be doing this. They're, they're starting <laughs> to look good now. Like they they got these. They always had the blue chip players, you know, the 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 five stars, but they never were developing them. And last year, it felt like you were really seeing the development come through on those guys. Yeah, Quentin, I'm sorry, first of all. Uh, Quentin and I have never had a conversation before, and uh, I, I got I talked to way too many people. And uh, <laughs> yes, that, that information was funneled to me. Yes, you are the NFL draft guy, so we will kick into gear on the NFL draft conversation. Nick and I started in on that, and you guys can really slice and dice where these Texas players uh, could fall. But I'll throw it out since you are a Texas Tech guy, and I don't need to remind you that that was like the chic pick last year. Oh, Texas Tech's going to – they're going to pull off this upset and knock Texas out of – I even went that route. I, I'm ashamed to say it. Yeah. I went that route, and I had some kind of crazy four-way tie for second place in the Big 12. But anyway hey, – Joey uh, McGuire's guys close, played everyone uh, tough. If, they played you know, they everyone tough. I don't know. I think, I think Texas uh, won my 50. <laughs> everyone else, everyone else. I, I blocked that one out of my memory <laughs> so take it away with uh, the nfl draft because nick was going through murphy is almost the surefire first rounder sweat probably a bigger name i would guess across college football circles but uh, probably a, a more like a third rounder but i'll let you guys take it from here yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion, uh, Quentin. What do you think, you know, Tavondre Sweat had the DWI. Do you think, how much do you think that it affects his draft um, implications? Because, I mean, in the past, you see guys with something like that, especially this close to the draft, you probably, like, lose half a round, in my opinion. But what do you think? I mean, I think for a guy like him who had some questions about his off-the-field work ethic already in scouting circles, that's the type of thing that can weigh heavily. In my opinion, like I wouldn't be shocked if it might knock him a full round down, but it's tough to say because that's type of stuff that's teams are going to feel more OK with it or less OK with it based on what they heard in interviews with him. Right. And when they talk to him, how they feel coming out of it. And, you know, if you're a Super Bowl contending team who runs a three down front, three man front, you might feel a lot more OK with it than when you're an even front team who is, you know, just hoping to make the playoffs this year at best. 
so there there's a big variation there and where you know where the board is sitting at the end of the third round he'll probably go in there if there's that right fit that right fit for the right team if there's not he might keep falling it's just tough to say it's awesome yeah you know so i actually did just a little research too and i was looking at you know, um, guys who ran faster than a four to eight or something like that. Right. And, you know, just how good were those guys? Right. Uh, you know, so we know that Worthy ran the four to one. And so we seen like the guys like John Ross who came in and ran the four two two. How do you think Worthy translates to the NFL? So I do feel a little bit better about Worthy than I usually I would when I just see the the speedster who blew up the combine and, and went jumping up draft boards. Like he's going to be a Raider, right? That's the way that works. <laughs> yeah. But um, I do like Worthy's route running a lot, yeah. a lot more than some of those other guys. He's a, a lot more detailed in his cuts, in his, uh, a, a lot of times when you find guys that fast, they're not that agile. Yeah, I feel like agile. Worthy yeah. is. So it's a bit different of an athlete. Um, I mean, that's almost more like a, a guy who was also a Longhorn, like a, a Marquise Goodwin or not Goodwin. Um, I forget his name off the top of my head, but anyways, I do think he will translate a little bit better than that. I'm not sure if you're drafting him, you're probably never looking at like a number one receiver type, but you get him on a team that has a few other receivers. He is exponentially more dangerous, right? If you can start drawing up free releases for him off the line of scrimmage, because you have, a Tyreek Hill and a Jalen Waddle out there with him, he becomes so dangerous. It's like just get the ball in his hands. It doesn't really matter where it is. The guy runs a four-two-one. Like he will find space in the right offenses. So that one, it's a lot about scheme fit. But I do like what he has to offer on the tape a lot more than I do typically your just you know straight line speedsters. Yeah, man, his his route tree is amazing. You know, um, yeah. I went to a ton of Texas games this year. And uh, yeah, his his route tree is just outstanding. He has really good feet too. You can tell he's a hard worker too. Um, you know, I can see him if somebody in the back of the first round gets him. It just depends on what team it's going to be. Um, if Kansas City gets him, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Andy Reid will do some fun stuff. Like, it's like Lord have mercy, you know. <laughs> that's one where like the other receivers might not matter as much because Andy Reid just pulls that type of weight, you know. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, I was thinking of Dolphins too. Like you saw Mike McDaniel talking with him. And I mean, if he falls past like the first round, early second round, I could easily see the Dolphins trading up and getting him. And that, what that guy does with Tyreek Hill, he will just do the exact same thing with Xavier Worthy. And imagine oh those God. two guys plus Jalen Waddle. Plus I mean, Jalen Waddle. Yeah. Right. And uh, A chain in the backfield. Oh. I mean, my God, the speed on that. You could run yeah. a four by four and they're winning. They're smoking everyone. They might fit, yeah. they might place in the Olympics. That's how fast that's going <laughs> So it'd be insane. Um, so a question with you guys on A.D. Mitchell, and I kind of agree with it. I think personally, I think he's the third most talented wide receiver in this draft. I really believe that. But I do agree with what um, some draft guys are saying about him taking plays off, him not you know giving it his all on certain routes and even blocking. Um, what do you do? You think he'll turn that on in the pros, or do you think that just is something that's ingrained in him? Personally, I think that some of that is not ingrained in him. I think some of it is a Sarkeesian effect, right? I think there's a little bit of Art Bryles to the offense where it's like, we know all our reads are over here. A.D. Mitchell's over here taking up space, eating up defenders. A.D., don't, don't waste your energy on that. We need you. We need you full go when we're looking to your side of the field. We need you to have all the gas in the tank. So take this play off. That, that's, that's just my vibe that I get on tape of when I see a play where he's, you know, Lacks a day is a cold, not even really doing anything, just knows he's taking up space. And Quinn Ewers is going right one, right two, and making a quick decision. It's like he did his job on that play was just to be in space. So I do think some of that is getting looked at as, oh, well, he's lazy. I don't care if he's lazy on that play because when you're running 80 plays a game like you mm -hmm. are in, in a in a, a spread offense like that in college or an air raid or however you want to describe any, I'm not sure what, what you'd call Sark's offense, but your guys need their juice and he's, he's out there every snap. He needs that juice in the tank. So I think that there is something to the offense where you can say, we feel pretty comfortable that this will translate better as far as him not taking as many plays off. 
but there are still concerns about it because there are some plays where it's like, man, if you were running a little harder there, you had the ball or, you know, your running back was 50 yards downfield. If you catch that block, that type of stuff. So a little bit concerned about it, but I'm probably someone who's willing to wave it off a little more than others because, you know, you, you say third most talented receiver in the class. I'm thinking that right. Like between him and Brian Thomas Jr. It's probably a toss up, right? Both guys are extremely physically gifted, but AD's got the release package. AD's yeah. got the route tree. AD, when he, if you need him to get open, he'll get open. And the jump and ball too. Some of his yeah. advanced stats say that he won't, and it's really perplexing, right? But when you look at a guy who's played five college playoff games and has five touchdowns in those games, you start to feel like, what are we talking about here? <laughs> and yeah, that to that point, I was thinking the exact same thing. Like in big games, he shows up 100%. It's just all the other little stuff. If he can just do that, he's 100% a number one at the NFL level. And I think he's a high end number one. It's just those little things. If he can just get those um, flipped around and turned on, I think, I think it'll be great. Yeah. You know, um, you know, Quentin, so what about, um, you know, JT Sanders, man? He didn't have the best pro day. You know, uh, you know, how is that going to affect his draft stock? What do you think? Yeah. I, w- I was surprised by his pro day numbers, honestly. And like, I, I, I might've come into his athletic testing a little lower on him than the field, but now I feel like I'm higher than the field on him in some ways, because it's like people see are seeing some of those numbers and just throwing it out. I'm, I'm wondering if it might've just been a bad day for the guy or something. Cause you, you watch him play, you, you see the basketball traits, right? You, you see them there. You see the, the, the ability to move in space, his ability to cut his straight line speed. It's all really nice. And I, I don't think the pro day testing is a completely accurate assessment of what he is on the field because sure there's, there's rawness there. There's some stuff that he's, he has a lot to learn still, but he's a gamer. He's not afraid of contact and he's going out there and making plays. I do think a little bit in his profile and I, I know you just asked about the testing, but is it okay if I jump into the profile yeah, a little do bit, it, do it, do it. The one thing that worries me a little bit with him is playing on an offense where you had two, maybe three receivers who are about to get drafted. A lot of space was able to be created for him by by Sark. So I I do, I am a little bit wary about how he can create space within routes. He has the athletic ability to do it. It's just the know-how, but having that, having that athletic ability, which as we said, with the testing, it doesn't look like he does, but, I'm not buying it yet. Um, having to learn it, that's half the tight ends in any draft class. You know, yeah. these guys come in the NFL. They, the college offenses don't use their tight ends very well in general. You know, it's if they can get them to block half decent, they're happy, right? Like, and then just dump off passes, uh, play action stuff where you can just get the guy open because a 19-year-old linebacker thinks he's coming to pancake him, like that type of stuff. You can just make work in college. You need a little more in the NFL. And I think it's something he should be able to do as much as you can think it without ever talking to the guy. Yeah, you know, one thing about him too as well is uh, any team that picks up JT Sanders are getting a big ball of clay. You know, this is a guy that really never played tight end until he got to Texas. You know, he was a wide receiver in high school a great defensive end in high school. Many thought he was going to be the savior at end for us here at Texas, right? We were mad that he went to tight end, right? (laughs) You know, but uh, yeah, he's, um, you know, he's a huge ball of clay. He's a guy that just started playing tight end. So, you know, uh, I think in my opinion, uh, you know, any team that that actually picks him up, they're going to get a huge ball of clay. They're going to be able to mold him to what they need him to be. You already see that he's a, he's a guy that can run, Uh, you know, his Ford is what a four, six, five or something like that. You know, um, you know, he's about 250 pounds now, 245 pounds, but his frame is a lot larger. He can put on more weight, too. And if he can keep that speed, man, you know, and uh, and just figure out how to get open. I think he's going to be awesome in the league. No, I completely agree. I think he's one of those guys. I think you see one, maybe two at every position that just plays like they're faster on the field in pads than they are in testing. And I think he's one of those guys. I think another guy like that, he's not in Texas, but I think Keon Coleman's the same way. I know yeah. he tested bad, but they're just certain guys. When you watch them on the field, they're like, wow, that guy's pretty fast. Then you see him in testing. Oh, he's not that fast. And I think just Avian Sanders is the perfect example of that. He's, he's just too natural of an athlete for me to believe those are his testing numbers when he gets on the field. So I think, I think it'll be great in the NFL. And I also think for whatever reason, I think he's going to the Bengals. I, I totally <laughs> believe that's where he's going. I think that's where he, I think it'd be a good fit as well. They need a tight end in that offense with Zach Taylor and um, Joe Burrow. So that'd be awesome. 
That'd be awesome. How about um, Watts, man? What do you think about Ryan Watts? You know, Ryan Watts was a guy I I wasn't able to get much tape on him. Yeah. I, like I, I just I just took a look at him for this, but I, I flipped on what I had. It's a big dude. He's big, man. That's a big dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he has, he has arm length that offensive tackles are jealous of. Yeah. And that's saying something. You, you don't find corners with 34 and a half inch long arms that often. So you're talking about some freaky size, some pretty nice athleticism for that size. And I thought a pretty smooth athlete, all things considered. Um, there is some choppiness in his back pedal that I saw a little bit stiff in the hips when he when he's uh, flipping his hips in his transition. I I was watching him and I, I had two thoughts. The first thought is this is Dan Quinn's guy. Yeah. Dan Quinn is going to draft this guy. He's, he loved it, dude. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And my second thought was, I wonder if they're going to ask him to play safety. <laughs> it's funny you say that. Texas you know, did. <laughs> it's funny that you say that, you know, because Michael Griffin, you know, from Texas, he, you know, he said, look, mm-hmm. Watts is an NFL safety. Like he's, he's a, he's an NFL safety. If he played safety, he's a second, third round pick basically. And, and he's having a long ass career at safety, you know? So Mike Griffin said the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we you wanted him to come it. back and do that this year. And he basically said, <laughs> yeah. now nah, I'll just go to the NFL if you're going to do that. <laughs> oh, I didn't even realize he's still at eligibility. Cause I mean, I, I hadn't watched him in my, in my previous stuff until talking to you guys about coming on here. I was like, okay, I gotta go watch him now. And it was one of my first thoughts, like with his, his size, his, his straight line downhill speed is really nice, but it's, some of the fine points of playing press coverage, it's like, I'm not sure he he, he might lose a step and then I, I'm not sure he can recover, you know? Yeah. Well, we kind of saw that in the Washington game. He was always half a step behind the wide receivers. Like he has, I think, average cornerback athleticism. But then when you go like, if he was a safety, he would be a freak athlete at safety. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that, he should definitely play there. I hoping he's more open-minded now that he's on, in the NFL. And he's like, well, making a lot more money. I want to do well for my career because he like, he could have come back. That was the thing talk all off season is come back, play safety, boost your draft stock. And I thought he should have done that, but then he had the great combine. So, I mean, if he's a third round pick and he's wanting to play safety, I think like Nino said, I think he's got a long career ahead of him if he decides to do that. Well, and I think I read he played safety in high school. So it's not like it's it, the, the footwork from, because the footwork from corner to safety, like it's pretty, it, it's not an easy transition he's a guy who has done it before so you would think he knows the footwork fairly well and that might be part of what's tying him up a little at corner honestly is he's going against his natural footwork at safety yeah yeah that's interesting um how about jonathan brooks man you know i've been you know you know just reading the you know you know just stuff about him and saying that he's possibly like the like the first running back taken but with the knee injury what do you think i do think without the knee injury i think he'd be the first running back taken i mean you I flipped on his tape and was just like, this is the dude. This is the, I'd already watched a fair amount of running back in this class. And as you guys might know, it's not the strongest running back class. I was like, this is the, this guy would be the guy who's ever, everyone's talking about a running back, not for that knee injury. You know, he's fast, he's big, he's strong. He can, he can bowl you over and probably not the most physical runner, but he has the size to bowl you over. And I don't think he's, he's not shying away from contact. And then just the, the short area, like lateral bursts at mm-hmm. his size, I think are, are pretty special. And, you know, it's tough to say with the torn ACL, but I feel like the last I don't know, five, 10 years, torn ACLs haven't had that huge an impact on guys mm-hmm. losing much athleticism, which is something that makes it kind of weird to me that he would fall that much from, you know, from that injury. But it seems like he has fallen a little bit down the board and also some of it is always just draft fatigue. You know, this guy was the RB one when it all started by now he hasn't done any testing. I think you yeah. see it at multiple positions, guys who didn't test, they tend to fall down the board a little and then people might be surprised on draft day when they go where they go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I've always comped him to, uh, like a Levy on bill. That's very, yeah. That's very exactly patient. What I was gonna say. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's so patient, man. It's like, it's like he's so patient. He kind of looks around for the hole and then he hits it, man. And then after that, he's he's off to the races. He's he's strong, great vision, um, you know. And it, it it just shows a lot about him because I think Texas fans we saw him for two years previously, and 
he had to wait his time on Bijan and Roshan, right? And mm-hmm. and uh, look, he waited his time, and once he got his time to shine, he shined, man. He shined. I was one of the first people two years ago on this channel, Mark. I don't know if you remember. I said, this guy's going to put up better stats in his one year whenever he gets it than Bijan Robinson. And I didn't say he was a better player. I said he was going to be playing a better system with a better offensive line, and he's a hell of a player, and that Bingo. is why. And I said that. I was – uh, telling people we'll be fine. Jonathan Brooks has got us. Jonathan exactly. Brooks got us, and he had us. He's phenomenal. I love that guy. I love the way he runs. And you know, you killed it with the lady on Bell. That's something I've been saying as well. He's he's sm- smooth going through the hole. Like he glides. He's not like super fast, but he just glides as he runs. And he's so fun to watch. He's so good, man. I tell you what, I took a lot of a lot of hell too because I I said the same thing, man. I said, look, Texas running game is going to be just as good, if not better, this year. And people gave me hell. We're losing Bijan. We're losing Roshan. Like, come on, man. I'm like, their offensive line is going to be light years better. And Jonathan Brooks is no slouch. You know what I'm saying? He's he's not Bijan, of course. There's there's not many like Bijan. Bijan's a different animal, right? He's just different. Uh, but th- look, our line was was light years better than anything we had two years ago, man. So to have that couple with Brooks and then you're starting to see the factory now too, you know? So I, I think this is going to kind of, kind of jump Texas with the, with the RBU discussion, right? You know, like Jonathan Brooks will get drafted this year. And then in, you know, two years from now, you're going to be looking at a guy like uh, Baxter, who will be a first or second round pick that size and speed combination, Jaden blue, who's, who's running a four uh, high four, two low four, three as well, that people, you know, always forget about because he didn't play his senior year. He was the number one runback in the country, folks, when he came out of high school, right? And so you got him. You see what he's doing now. And so it's just like Texas is starting to stack him. Sark's starting to get the guys he wants. Um, he he had some great talent, you know, that was from the previous staffs, and you're seeing him just compound on that with the talent that, you know, you know he has to now. So Yeah, and I think we have five guys, honestly, all five yeah. of them playing the NFL. Like <laughs> Man. Christian Clark and Jerry. Christian Gibson. Clark. Yeah. <laughs> My God, Christian yeah, Clark. Trey, be- Trey Wisner is going to get carries this year, and he's going to look good when he gets the carries. So Trey's a beast. Trey's yeah. a beast. Yeah. If you Jay know, so- Blue doesn't go to the league after this year, one of them's probably going to transfer. So Jay yeah. having a fantastic year and make yourself a lot of money. And I'm a big fan because I, I think he's the best running back in the room personally, but um, it's exciting. It really is. We've started to create a factor at certain positions. Are we all the way there on every position? No, but we're closer than we have been since the Mac Brown era. Most definitely. Most definitely. Hey, Quinn, how about this one, man? Christian Jones. We've seen him, you know, kind of mature from being a guy that Texas fans probably didn't even want to see the field, yeah. <laughs> you know? And then, you know, he comes in and, and Cal Flood with his development. Um, and we're seeing Christian Jones might be a top 150 pick, you think? Yeah, I mean, I've got him top 120 on my board. I mean, I I really liked what I saw from Christian Jones. I do, and I mean I'm a I'm a trench guy at heart. Like O line, D line is what I really enjoy watching. And Christian Jones, I mean, I just saw big and, and Grant, I didn't pay a lot of attention to him prior to this past year because this was the year he entered the draft so that's where i watched a bunch of tape on him and i saw a big strong dude who you couldn't go through long arms might have some hip tightness like he he might not be able to match the best speed on the corner but i saw a guy that at the nfl level i think you can have on the field and feel okay about like you can play him and not feel like you're gonna have a liability there because he has one weakness and the rest all feels pretty good to me. Just those tight hips. So yeah. you can cover that up. You can give him tight end help. You can give him chip help. You can find ways around that when a guy has a strong anchor like that and good length like that to be able to counter, to be able to um, get back inside, protect against inside moves. I think that there is a lot of good stuff to work with, with Christian Jones. And I only felt more confident in that after going down to the senior bowl practices and watching him just do pretty darn well all three days of practices out there against, you know, the best guys in the draft. Yeah. And he has good feet too. You know, yeah. like a lot of people don't know that he was a soccer player in high school. Right. Yeah. And so he has really good feet, man, for a big guy, very nimble. Um, you know, it's so one of my favorite players, man, is Jordan Whittington, you know, and I think him not being able to, you know, take in the drills at the combine, I think that, you know, like hurt him, but, you know, how do you feel, you know, him going to the league and being a slide in, you know, and what round does he kind of project that? I think he's looking around sixth, seventh round really right now. And really the the reason why I think that he does get drafted 
is because he's got special teams experience. Mm -hmm. He he is going to make a team on his special teams ability. And then from there, it's about him taking advantage of his opportunities. He seems like a guy who's going to, you know, lives and breathes football and he's going to do everything he has to, to keep playing it. So getting that a special special teams role is going to be big for him because then he can just work on getting better and getting better and getting better and then develop into a role where I, I think a big slot role is where he's going to fit in, in the NFL eventually once he works his way into the rotation there and gets his snaps to prove himself on Sundays. I think that he's the kind of guy who once he gets those snaps he might not look back because he, he he's a gamer. I mean, yeah. I don't think he's the best separator out there. I think a lot of his production did come on from what I saw screens and underneath routes and stuff where it's like you're relying on some of the bigger name receivers to really create these, these openings and these bubbles. And he's the guy who can take advantage of it, but you know what that happens in the NFL too. So I think that he's a guy who could come in in a big slot role, body, some smaller slot cornerbacks, and be able to eat up underneath space with routes with a real yak threat because he, I mean, he's fast. He might not be the fastest, but his ability to go from zero to 60 is really impressive. When he gets the ball and he turns up field, it's really impressive how fast he's getting 10, 15 yards. Yeah. And I think what you said, the gamer um, and special teams, if Bill Belichick was still coaching, he's, <laughs> he screams Patriots to me. And just because he's not coaching, I, I think the Ravens are a perfect fit with Harbaugh's background and special teams. He would absolutely love someone like that. And Keelan Robinson too. I think Keelan Robinson is one of those guys. If he just does what he does in college um, in the NFL, special teams wise, he's a guy that will play a decade long in the NFL, just special teams wise. So where do, do you have him on your big board getting drafted at all? Or do you think he's going to go undrafted? I don't have a round grade on him. Um, I've I've just watched him put some notes down. I'm not sure that he gets drafted, but wherever he ends up, it'll be interesting because, you know, he's only played 368 snaps in his college career. It's really hard to get drafted when your, your resume is that short, right? There's yeah. very little proof on tape. What the proof there was – I thought he had some really nice speed to the corner, nice one cut runner. Like he can, when he hits the gas, he flies through holes. Right. And a, he seemed like a capable receiver out of the backfield. Like they were asking him to do a fair amount in the receiving game, which in college, if you're asking the, the running backs to do anything in the receiving game, that guy's probably a pretty solid receiver because it doesn't really happen. It's kind of frustrating from a scouting standpoint because you can't actually see what kind of routes most of these guys can run or anything because everything's pretty watered down. But with that very limited snap count, I say it'll be interesting wherever he goes because he has extensive special teams experience, right? Core play, has played every special teams unit. I don't think he returned punts. That's the only area where it's kind of you wish that you saw that because he did return kicks and he has the speed to be a threat there. But, I mean, he was on punt cover units. He was on kick cover units, everything. So he has a chance to just jump on a roster and stick there because no one – like, it, people laugh about special teams, but you need guys. You need someone who can play there, right? Well, and in the NFL, the margin's so small, too. Like, that's the difference in games in the NFL. In college, it may not be, but in the NFL, it 100% is. You see games won and lost all the time, at least a couple times a Sunday – on special teams and he blocked, I think like five or six punts at Texas. So yeah, he has yeah. the capability. He, and he was so close on so many other ones. Um, he's probably one of the best special teams players I've ever seen. Now, like he's that good. That's why I think he can just spend all his time at special teams and be, he can be like a Matthew Slater in the NFL special teams. That guy made $50 million playing special teams for about 15 years. Yeah. And I do think he has some upside as a runner. I mean, he gets in the right committee and he becomes their their one cut runner, their, their guy who they want when they they're going to run uh, power schemes where they just open this gap and say, hey, you go. I think he can do that pretty well. So I, I do think he has a chance in the league. I'm just not sure if he's actually going to get the, the chance to be drafted because of that lack of um, experience on the offense. That's awesome. I think that's all the players, right? <laughs> <laughs> the only one I can think of, I guess, is uh, Jalen Ford. I, I oh, Jalen Ford. Like, he's been yeah. all over the map. Um, I've seen like third round. I've seen sixth round. I've seen like at, earlier on. I saw undrafted, but that's kind of gone to the wayside. So, what what do you? Where do you have him at? I've got a fifth to sixth round grade on him. Um, I think that he 
he lacks some size to be a stack linebacker. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want him taking on blocks, but there's some scheme specific specificity to his game because he is a really nice player for a downhill attacking defense, right? You don't want him sitting on his heels, thinking about coverage. You want him going downhill into the running lanes because he can really cause some, some chaos there with his athleticism. And I, he does have the strength to play through blocks. I just don't think you want him doing it on his heels. You want him doing it moving forward because he is a much more natural football player moving forward than he is moving backwards. And I'm not sure you can coach that moving backwards into guys as much as um, you can coach a guy to move forward within the defense. And I don't love his coverage. So you're talking about a thumper. You're talking about like a, a, a three, four Mike, I think something like that, where you, you can afford to be a little more undersized, but you're just, you're going downhill. You're going in attack mode. And I do think he offers special teams ability because of that too. And I, I actually, I didn't remember to look up his special team snap counts, but he seems like a guy who would really excel on the, the new kickoff rules mm-hmm. where you're going yeah. forward. You're trying to break through blockers and, uh, close down run lanes. I think that's something that he can really do well and be an asset to in the new kick return rules. Yeah, I agree. I think Benda and Ford were both really good getting downhill. But and I'm surprised more teams didn't try to attack us with the running backs out of the backfield, like going down the sidelines. Like Alabama did try the one time, but uh, Milrow couldn't plead to, um, to McClellan when they uh, tested Benda. So he definitely needs to work on that. But I I agree. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because, you know, in the previous year, he made a bunch of plays. I mean, he was intercepting yeah. balls like crazy. Um, you know, so there's a, you know, the uh, the uh, the comment down there. So I don't know if he plateaued last year. I just think the previous year, it was kind of like a – it was an all Big 12 kind of year. It's an all-American year, right? So he was second-team all-American, I think, that year. So um, it, it's kind of hard to duplicate those years, especially at that position. Um, so, you know, he, he was around the ball a lot. You know, uh, but last year, I wouldn't say he wasn't. It was just some of those balls didn't actually fall his way. Right. So, look, um, I'm with you. I think he's going to be a hell of a special teams guy, too, as well. But if he gets with the right team that just thumps, like you say, man, he'll be pretty good. This is our uh, Texas relaunch party. We appreciate uh, Nick being here from Nino's Corner. We appreciate uh, Quentin and Quentin. It's uh, let me get this straight on tap sports net. Correct. Yes, correct. And it's also yeah. Bud Kiss stats on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So that was uh, the, the handle. Me, <laughs> go ahead. If Quentin will forgive me, I uh, would love to have you back uh, to talk uh, some other teams uh, draft selections uh, here in the next. Oh, we don't have too much time in the next week or 10 days. Yeah, absolutely. Let me know. Let me know time and day. And I'll, uh, as long as, as long as I'm not already calendared up, I'd love to. Awesome. Awesome. And since you're no longer in the big 12 or we're no longer (laughs) in the big 12 anymore, good luck to your big 12 season this year. (laughs) Yeah. Good luck in the sec guys. It's going to be rough, man. (laughs) It'll be fun. It's going to be fun. (laughs) Yeah. Everyone in the big 12 just going to finish six and six. (laughs) Yeah. No the one who gets to seven, they're going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, I think the league's going to be a lot of fun next year. You know, it's it's it's, it's going to be a lot of fun next year. And so, you know, I'm you know I'm excited, you know, just to see just college football just you know period die. But you know that you know the SEC bringing in Texas and you know bringing in you know the the the, the folks from up north. I won't say their name. Um, and, you know, and then this it's a big tour bringing in all those teams, man, getting the Colorados and everybody to come into as well. It's going to be very interesting. A lot of eyes will be in the Big 12 next year. Yeah, yeah I think no, the Big 12 be might wild. be the most, like, fun conference to watch. I'm not going to say it's going to be the best football, but I think it might be the most fun to watch because any given Saturday, I could see the worst team in that league beating the best team in that league, whereas the SEC, Vanderbilt's not going to beat whoever the top uh, dog in the SEC ends up being. Yeah. You know, I think the I think the new Big 12 is going to be like the Pac-12. You know, you know, you know how the Pac-12 used to be where, yeah. where you know, like your Washington States would come out and – you know, and they would go five and oh, right. And, you know, and they would beat some teams and then they probably lose four or five games in a row, but they were exciting. Right. You know, like last year they had that with Kim Ward, you know, your, your uh, Washington state, your Oregon states and things of that nature. So, um, you know, I'll be watching the big 12. I have, you know, I have a cousin that actually plays for Colorado. So, you know, I'll be watching every Colorado game, but you know, that's, that's, you know, hopefully, hopefully that's it for me, but definitely, man, it's going to be a very fun, you know, like league. So. Happy 
Quentin, we appreciate you stopping by, man. And everybody join uh, Quentin's work there at ontapsportsnet.com and also Budkiss Stats on YouTube. It's easy to find. It's Budkiss Stats, one word. I found it like that, so you can find it right here. Check out the draft analysis right there. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Have a good night. Cool. Thank, Thank you. Quentin. We've got uh, Andrew Miller dropping by from Hook'em Headlines. Andrew, how you doing tonight? Good, Mark. How are you? Doing Kevin. well, doing well. And uh, as stated to these guys, I'll get out of the way and let you guys chop it up. But we'll get started by uh, what you would like to see this Saturday. What uh, piques your interest the most? Mm. Uh, oh, man. that's There's a lot there. Uh, what's up, Nick, by the way? Uh, hey, man. What's going on? I, you know, I think for this Saturday, um, I want to see... I want to see how we're getting at it in the trenches. I think like a lot of the speculation, a lot of the talk, a lot of the reports coming out of spring ball has been, you know, Texas being able to run the ball very, very effectively, almost too effectively um, up the middle that, you know, you want to see the defensive line hold their own a little bit. And you want to see how, you know, maybe the second team defensive line is able to do against, you know, the first team offensive line to see how we're able to rotate and how that depth is, is coming along. You got guys like Dre Bledsoe, like uh, Aaron Bryant, that that you really want to see make that leap this year. You also want to see guys like Tia Savea, um really, you know, re- really show what what they can bring to the table out of the transfer portal along the defensive line. Um, on offense, I mean, I'm excited to see what some of the new receivers can do, especially against this uh, really kind of beefed up secondary. Um, you know, this is there's a lot of new pieces on the team and there's a lot of good returning starters. And so um, seeing how it all meshes together on offense is going to be really fun on Saturday. Before we keep it rolling here, Nick, thanks so much for being here, man. Everybody check out uh, Nick's work at uh, Nino's corner. It's right here on YouTube. It's easy to find. You'll want to make that a destination for your uh, Texas football coverage. So definitely do that. There it is. Nick battle Nino's corner. We always appreciate Nick stopping by Nick. Thank you for that and appreciate your breakdown man i right, appreciate it hook them and uh we'll keep it rolling both with andrew and we got uh a little perspective from fanatic perspective here uh what's going on man how we doing thanks for having me on mark good doing to be well. here good to see you here uh first appearance uh, at least uh with myself here at the voice of college football so welcome and uh, thanks for being here. We just brought Andrew on the line here from Hook'em Headlines as well. So uh, I'll toss out the same question to you uh, in, t- in terms of uh, what you're looking out for today. And then I'll let Matthew take over and you guys can uh, ensue on some high level Texas uh, football talk. Sounds good. Um, so we're just talking in terms of right now and in, in, in outlook for the yeah i was just saying in regards to this saturday oh absolutely. saturday spring game yeah yeah so from from my vantage point I'll, I'll touch a little bit on offense and then defense offensively the 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 big name arch manning um hmm. quinn years is very established at the quarterback position and i, I know what to expect from quinn I think he's going to have a sensational season health willing. That's my big question with Quinn is, can he stay healthy? I need to know with that being said, I need to know that Arch can run this second team offense and, and run it confidently, especially with the complexity that there is in Steve Sarkeesian's scheme. And so I think Saturday is a big, big showcase for Arch because he's kind of been you know, held back a little bit and it's been kind of behind the scenes and, you know, we really want to see if he can run this thing full tilt. So that's what I'm looking to see offensively. Can they be sharp? Can they be on time? Because the last two seasons with Quinn Ewers as our quarterback, we've had to use two quarterbacks. So that's very, very, very significant um, for for me this Saturday, just to feel, feel, feel good about it. And as well as feeling good about Arch's development, um, you know, going into when he's eventually going to take over as our starter. Defensively, can we stop the run? We've been an elite run defense the last couple of years, but the suspects that were keys to that success for us are now gone, right? Tavondre Sweat, 
Byron Murphy, Jalen Ford. So that middle of the defense, I'm really going to be paying attention to, to, to my young boys like Anthony Hill, um, a veteran like David Benda at linebacker and having those comms, especially with now having helmet communication, but also our defensive tackles, which I'm sure Andrew's talked about. Murphy and Tavondre Sweat, two of the highest graded defensive tackles from last year, right? So the middle of that defense in general, I, I want to make sure that we're not just going to, you know, switch cheese through there, especially with having a team like Michigan week two, right? So offense and defense, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, just to piggyback off that, I do want to see uh, Quinn Ewers drive the ball. I think that's something he needs to work on. He tends to throw off his back foot too much for my liking. If he can drive it a little bit more, I want to see that. I don't know if we'll get that in the spring game, but just going into the season in general. And then, yeah, Steven hit on it. Up the middle, you lose your two best players, and then you also lose a veteran linebacker in Jalen Ford who's going to take over for him, who does well, especially, again, with the in-helmet communication. I think that's a big thing. I think that's a bigger thing on the defensive side of the ball than the offensive side of the ball, honestly. So who's going to take that role? Are they going to experiment with multiple guys in the spring game? And then who earns that role, I guess? Um, I do want to see from T.S. Villa up the middle. Um, we're probably going to be looking in the portal at the defensive tackle position. Um, you know, Bill Norton did enter from Arizona. I think he's a good player. I don't obviously no one's going to match Murphy or Sweat. Um, so can we finally get Alfred Collins to live up to the potential? For God's sakes, we've heard it for like three years. Please, I'm asking, just live up to your potential. We saw Murphy, they, the staff got the best out of him. The staff got the best out of Tavondre Sweat. This is the last guy, it really is. This is the last guy with Texas fans have been begging, play up to your potential, because we've heard it. We heard Chris Ash when he was here say, this guy is as talented as the Bosa brothers and Chase Young. That is something Chris Ash said when he was here on the 40 Acres, and he just has not played up to that level. We've heard practice reports of him playing up to that level, but he doesn't do it consistently in the game, so that's another thing to look out for too as well. Yeah, I mean, Matthew, to your point, and uh, Steve and I, I, yeah, that was kind of the first thing I mentioned for the spring game was, you know, what are we going to be able to do along the defensive line? Um, not to beat a dead horse with that, but yeah, I mean, with Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton, I mean, I, I still think Broughton has some untapped potential in him. I think that pad level wise, technique wise, um, I mean, he's what a fourth fifth year player now so i don't know how much more you can do with him in terms of like adding weight where it needs to be or getting stronger but um i mean for him just technique wise maybe getting a little bit more proficient um you know plugging those gaps and run defense getting to the ball carrier alfred collins yeah that consistency factor is really the thing i mean i think i think what you don't want to see is some of those ups and downs where maybe you get five games where maybe he's like one of the highest graded defensive tackles in the sec and he's really making a huge impact always around the line of scrimmage and then you have another five games where he's just you know he's just a little bit invisible on the field you the effort's not where you need it to be um i don't know how much you're going to learn from the spring game for that but you know you want to see him make those strides through the end of spring ball really finish on a strong note carry that momentum into into preseason camp um arch manning i really yeah steven i like that point that you bring up there because like some of the stuff we've heard from spring ball we've heard that you know he's gotten stronger really got down to work in in, in off-season workouts um you know is getting the ball out quicker deep ball has been looking good but still like you're hearing about things here and there it's more you know complicated developing route concepts he's not he's not on the same page with his receivers he's getting picked off by some of the younger corners I mean, I, well, I guess he's gotten picked off multiple times this spring, including in last weekend's scrimmage. So um, not to like press the panic button there because I don't think that's any reason to. But, you know, you want Arch to be – I think you want Arch to be a little bit further along than Malik was last year. You know, Arch has had two years – this is his second year in the system and he hasn't had those injury issues that, that Malik had on the 40, which kind of limited his development. So, you know, yeah, I – I want to see I want to see Arch be able to really hit some pinpoint throws. Look to be on the same page with the receivers this weekend. I mean, if you look at Arch right now, and I'm glad you brought up Malik Murphy because he had to play two games last year, yep. and he started a game against a super veteran BYU team that we beat with 35 to six or whatever, and then that yep. Kansas State game that was literally <laughs> down to yeah. the last snap. Right? A roller coaster the whole game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then the year before, you had Hudson Carr, 
right, who had to fill in and play tech, the Texas Tech game in multiple multiple games, including finishing Bama. out all of Bama, right? So until Quinn Ewers shows me that he can play a full 12 and, and postseason, Arch Man is going to play next year at some point. We have to assume that. So he has to show – it just can't be problematic. I understand development and all that. Like Hudson Card wasn't perfect, but we knew when Hudson Card was in the game, our offense was going to be on time. We knew we were, we're probably going to hit our average. Same thing with Malik last year. We averaged 35 points per game. We pretty much hit that when he was there. So as long as it's not, we're falling off a cliff, right? Like you saw that with Florida State when Jordan Travis came in or went down, right? Offensive productivity went off a cliff. You do not want that with QB2, especially with Arch and how delicate everything already is with the Mannings and, and his development. We want to make sure we're on track. So I think that's really, really important. And, you know, as you mentioned, Arch being kind of that one snap away from being the guy, you know, and you always got to be ready on the sideline. And, you know, I think to Malik last year, you know, you had guys like Adonai Mitchell, like JT Sanders that you could just throw up the ball to. I don't know if we have that guy this year. And I'm not saying we don't have weapons because we got weapons all over the place. You know, Amari Nyblack, I think is going to be a fantastic downfield threat. You know, I think Bond, Golden, they're going to be awesome. So is Wingo, Jonte in the second year. But, you know, Arch is going to have to really time his throws well. You can't just give up these or you can't just lob up these 50-50 balls and hope your guys going to bring them down. You you got to be on point. Well, that's another thing too about the spring game like will we see separation with our what whoever our number one wide receiver is going to be because last year you had two guys that are basically two number one wide receivers. This year you may not have a guy that's like a bona fide number one wide receiver. And that's the thing to Quinn too. Quinn's going to have to step up and play a little bit better because I think the wide receivers helped him out a lot last year. I think it's his turn this year to help out the wide receivers. So we'll see what happens. And on the Arch Manning point, he just can't do what Malik Murphy did in the second half, Kansas State. Like Malik Murphy tried to lose that game for Texas in the second half. You have enough talent around you to where if you just take control of those reins and you steady the ship, you're good enough to just continue um, winning games with this team. Unless, obviously, like if it goes out in the George game, I don't expect us to beat Georgia with Arch Manning as a quarterback. But let's say it's Kentucky. We can beat Kentucky with Arch Manning as a quarterback. That needs to be the goal for me is with Arch Manning this year. Yeah, I, I also don't see the same number of games this year that you can get Arch Manning in in like garbage time no. as you did with Malik and Arch. Or, or Yeah, I guess Malik and Arch last year. So you don't have those... You don't have those extra reps they're going to get garbage time during the fall. Yeah, the only conference game you have is going to be Vanderbilt on the road. Hopefully, we can put someone in. Um, when, isn't that one like week eight, though? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Hopefully, like if someone does get hurt, that's the game that it happens. Uh, everything else early, I mean, you're not going to do it versus Michigan. Um, co- we play Colorado State, correct? So, I, I mean. You're going to have to get people snaps in Colorado State. Game. State, yeah, you're going to have to. I think UTSA is going to be a solid ball club this year too. Yeah, that, we. I mean, the schedule is difficult, but you're going to have to find places for like ten to fifteen snaps for these guys. Because if I don't want Arch Manning's first snap to come in the big house or versus like Georgia week what five or six or whatever, so I don't want that happening. Yeah, not to get like squirrel mentality of like just like position change storylines, but you mentioned in the defensive backfield there, Matthew. But like, I, uh, you know. One of the things that I thought is really interesting this spring, and you mentioned the wide receiver defensive back matchups, like I think on the defensive side of the ball, our strength it might actually be the secondary this year. Um, I, I'd i be interested to hear, I talked with Tarek, uh, one of the other guys on the site, on, on our show last week about uh, who the best five would be to start in the defensive backfield. And I think a lot of people feel that Jade Barron at field corner would be the way to go i mean obviously he's been cross training there this spring and you know, gilbo's been looking good um i mean am i the only am i the only one here that's in the camp that we probably should be starting baron at corner this fall especially against some of the better offenses i'm not against that i think we should just be cross training everyone i think you have enough athletes back there to where you have makuba in the slot sometimes boundary corner sometimes safety like that's how i think it should go um we'll see what happens i don't know if that's gonna happen um but, yeah, it would be interesting if they kind of did it like a basketball situation where you throw your fast uh, five out there and see how it goes. I don't know if they're willing to do that, 
but I, I would be fine with that because I do agree with you. I think the secondary is going to be the strength this year. It just is. We have more talent back there than we have in a very long time compared to the front four and even front seven. We have a perfect combination of a lot of things, right? Experience, speed. We have different types of players for different types of matchups. I think we have a lot of guys that can play very well against the run. Um, and it's not, you know, and, and being able to tackle in space. But to the point about Jade playing field corner, my hesitance with that is he's had trouble against speed um, and, 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 and being beaten downfield in, in particular. I think he's really good in zone. He's really good when he's got eyes on the quarterback and he's instinctive. Um, one, if, if he was, if he had those abilities and he, this is what he has to show, because if he could do all that, he would have been gone. I mean, let's, let's keep it a buck, right? Like he would have, he was, he, he got his NFL eval. And part of that problem was, I mean, go look at the Oklahoma state game. And, and I hate to, I don't want to pick on the guy because I, I'm a big Jade Barron fan. I've been on Twitter saying Jade Barron first team, everything. Cause I love the way, what he brings from the nickel, but my my has I want to see him have that development and because if you have an issue with speed technique wise you have to be on point playing field corner and I know Terrence Brooks has not been flashy it's not been sexy and people still have a bad taste in their mouth from the Washington game but he was solid the, 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 it wasn't it wasn't something where I felt better about Terrence Brooks than I did about Deshaun Jameson I'll be on a hundred percent there so my thing is how am I matching up each week? For example, Michigan, I know we're going to be playing phone booth football that week. It's going to be 12 personnel. I might have to be in my traditional package where I only have four DBs. So Jade might just be out there at field and I don't have to play a nickel because I'm playing a third backer. I'm just saying. And then we're going to play uh, uh, people like Jeff Levy, right? And Ole Miss where we're going to have to spread it out. That's where the strength of this secondary will really show because I got multiple options based upon how you want to play me, right? So now if I got to play six DBs against Ole Miss, I could have Makuba and, and Jade and Jalen Gilbo on the field at the same time, right? So to me, it's just how we want to play it. Um, but at least I have that that depth there because, you know, there's going to be attrition at some point and guys are going to go down with the type of schedule we're playing. So I feel really, really good. I, I agree that secondary is probably the strength of this defense that we feel the best about, which is crazy to say as a Texas fan. Yeah, and I like Jalen Gilbo at the nickel. His, uh, his issues have been injury. If he can stay healthy, I, I think he can produce there. Um, and people need to – I mean, Terrence Brooks, what, did he just turn 20 years old? I think he came on. At, yes. Uh, yeah, so he's got plenty of time to get better. I'm I, He doesn't worry me at all. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Honestly – I'm just more worried about up the middle, like I, like uh, we talked about earlier. So I like the secondary. I think it's um very deep, and it like you said, it's got a good mixture of experience with like Michael Taff and those guys back there, and then you have Xavier Philsmy coming in too. So I think this can be one of the best secondaries in the country if they if you know it's um developed properly. Derek Williams year two. Yes. I mean, let's get like there's there's stuff to be excited about. I, I do pay attention though to what Sark has been saying. He's been throwing Easter eggs out there. I want playmakers. I want people to go get me the football. I know y'all can cover. I know y'all can execute the assignment. We're not worried about that anymore. I know even the Washington game, if people are gonna mosh you, you mosh. But I need people that can take the ball away. That's that's the next level of having that elite, almost scary secondary right and i know that's going to go in tandem with the pass rush i think we're going to be better at edge yeah to where people are going to have to get the ball out a tick faster but the the this i'm excited to see them get turnovers get takeaways i think people like Derek williams are going to be forcing fumbles right like you know some of the things we expected from last year's crew that we didn't really get um with some of the people that we brought on i i see that coming with, with people like d will so i'm excited even uh, Manny Muhammad, I mean, had an interception in the scrimmage. I mean, that guy, freakiest yeah. cornerback we've had in a while here. So um, it's it's exciting. I 100% agree with your edge point. I mean, you got Sorrell there, Ethan Burke, Trey Moore, Colin Simmons, who I think is going to have a really good year. So uh, the edge, we're going to have to rely on more this year. Last year, they, they were okay. They weren't great. 
are, we were great up the middle this year. We're going to have to be great on the edges and we can get by with, you know, the C plus game up the middle. That's what it's going to have to be. That's what the hands were dealt with right now. I think linebacker could be better. I know we lost Jalen Ford, but I think every other part of that linebacker room is deeper. I think Blackwell another year. I think Bend is going to be better. I think Blackshear gives us some SEC quality depth. And I think Anthony Hill is really going to make a leap. I mean, I know that it's going to be challenging for him, I think, a little bit to take on more of that true Mike linebacker role. Um, but, yeah, I guess that would be another thing to watch is how he can kind of handle some of those assignments if they test him a little bit in the spring game on Saturday. Yeah, I think that's what it comes down to in that room. If they want to be better this year at the linebacker position, it's going to be Anthony Hill. Like, if Anthony Hill takes that next step, I completely agree with that. I think we're better at linebacker. There's a lot of pressure on Coach Nansen right off the, right yeah, off the yeah, bat. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure on Coach Nansen because you don't want to have a Harold Perkins situation no. like last year in year two when Harold Perkins had to assume that Mike responsibility and it was it was it overwhelmed him a little bit I felt like I think he improved throughout the season for LSU but there's been some of that concern with Anthony Hill if if it's too much if we're putting too much on his plate I think he's been one of the people that has been practicing with the mic in his helmet and and which you know IQ wise you need to be able to communicate as well so that's a positive but I'm with y'all I mean in terms of the back, we have more, uh, just like we talked about the diversity with the secondary, you have a diversity with linebackers. I mean, don't sleep on Leona Lefau, right? Yeah. And and Mo Blackwell would have been my breakout player last year if not for his injury. He missed a lot of time or else, you know, he probably would have been a, been, been a bit more part of our defense last year. So a lot of options there, but uh, with Anthony Hill, I'm, I'm very protective of his development. Um, but I am excited to see a Texas defense to ha that has Anthony Hill and Colin Simmons on the field at the same time. That That's going to be crazy. Yeah. I think that in 25, that could be an all-SEC first-team duo right there. I think that – I mean, because realistically, Simmons, if you – like, what did Hill have last year? Like five and a half, six and a half sacks? I think he was around four or five. I think he's four and a half, yeah. Was he four? I thought he had more. Okay. But even that is like crazy for a true freshman linebacker. Like if you can get like six, seven sacks out of a true freshman, that's, that's a future first rounder right there more than likely, especially on a defense as talented as Texas is. So I and think, I, we'll, yeah, I completely agree with what you said, Stephen, about Mo Blackwell. I think he's like the Swiss army knife um, in the defense and we need someone to cover running backs out of the backfield. Like I, David Benda and Jalen Ford struggled with that. And I think he's the guy for that um, job. Um, so hopefully he can stay healthy. That's That's been his issue too. So I'm hoping for a big year from him. There's one other freak that we haven't mentioned. That Jelani. Jelani. Jelani McDonald. Jelani McDonald. He's going he's gonna to play somewhere. I mean, I, 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 the, enough's enough. He needs to be on the field. <laughs> at, at some, I mean, he started making noise on special teams at the very end of the season. I, I You know, I know we mentioned all the people in the secondary, but I, I feel like – PK and this this brain trust on Texas defense, when you have a weapon like Jelani McDonald, again, the diversity of offenses will play. There's he, he has to find a place somewhere for a talent like that. Yeah, well, we can we could rotate at safety with like four quality guys. This year. Yeah. We have that group. I mean, five guys, I think, that could each fit into that rotation. I don't think we're going to rotate five, but I think McDonald, probably Maku I mean, not definitely Makuba, Williams, and probably Taff. See if Phil Smith can work into that by the end of the season. I think would kind of be the ideal situation there. So, I mean, I think the defensive backfield is, yeah, like we, I think we all agree that's that's a really solid part. I just like, um, I, I want to see too. I guess one thing that I didn't say that I wanted to see on the offensive side of the ball that I think would be cool to see in the spring game and just moving forward is like, can Neto continue to kind of get that push for those first team reps. I think the upside of the offensive line, especially in run blocking is much higher with Neto than it is Hayden Connor. I get, you get that experience factor. Hayden Connor, probably more consistent pass blocker from what we know, but I, I think kind of like DJ Campbell compared to Cole Hudson last year, if, if Neto can really, you know, kind of push things along, develop well and, you know, seal off those first team reps that the upside for the offensive line is going to be even that much higher. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a possibility that you have four out of the five guys from that big class a couple years ago starting on the offensive line, which should tell you all you need to know what Sark's done with this roster compared to the previous head coaches. So that would be awesome. I'd love to see that. That would be interesting, too. That's another thing, like how they rotate the offensive line during the spring game, and I think it's something to look out for as well. Cross-training there, too. Kyle Flood has been big on the cross-training aspect. We know Cole Hudson can play multiple positions. It's been interesting, too, because I've been hearing that he's worked. He's also worked at left guard as well. So it seems like they've really ramped up the competition um, at, at Hayden Connor's spot, right? And it's, it's just, hey, we want to – we know we you've been good, but we, we're trying to be great. Um, and if especially if they're trying to execute more of some of the zone run scheme stuff, then, yeah, that will favor people like Neto uh, more than it would a Hayden Connor in that particular situation. So how those reps break down is going to be interesting. I think um, some of the center reps behind Jake Majors always interest me as well. So, you know, the, and, and, and Cam Williams, uh, just seeing him being consistent, right? Because he's playing next to DJ, and they have the chance to be Bash Brothers over there. Yeah. <laughs> but I also can see them being heavily penalized. So there's, there's I want to make sure that the comms over there is good. The handoffs are good in pass pro. I mean, DJ seems to have made just strides. I'm glad he just got to play last year. He needed those reps. So i um, interested to see how, you know, that all, where people are, are, are lining up come spring. Yeah, we still got, what, 17 scholarship guys along the offensive line, even after Kirkland left for the portal today. So, I mean, I, I'd say that, what, those 17 guys, 13 or 14, are like guys that you would probably feel comfortable for getting first in, somewhere in the first or second team. And so, cause like you got like what Brandon Baker, Daniel Cruz that are true freshmen early enrollees that are already like getting some second team reps and doing well. And I mean, Trevor Goosby making some strides. I think like Connor Stroh could be a guy that could, you know, future solid backup in, you know, Steven, you mentioned Cole Hudson, like your utility guy, Hayden Connor might be a backup this year. That's kind of crazy to say. So, like, I mean, yeah, this this offensive line, could it? I mean, yeah, it could be the best in the SEC if, you know, if it lives up to the hype. But Georgia's always got some mutants, so I'll yeah. hold off on that one. But we could be we could be second for sure. I think yeah. that's the goal to shoot for in the SEC. Yeah. I mean – I think we knew like the quarterback offensive line was going to be like the strength of the offense this year. So kind of got to rely on that. But also I like, I think the running back room might oh, end up yeah. being a strength too, just cause like Jaden blue and CJ Baxter are both really solid. Yeah. I think there's a possibility all five of those guys are going to deserve reps at some point in the year. And I don't know if we're going to have enough reps to give it out to them. Cause I think Trey Wisner is going to have, like, he's a good enough player to get, quality reps for this team he is but i don't know if he's gonna be able to crack or get not get on the field enough he at yeah. least will get some of the keelan robinson work yeah so there, there's something there and i know i wish it was more but the the if you know Jaden blue as long as the ball security is there you gotta play him right and cj's gonna be your thumper and and pad level you know Andrew, you're big on pad level. CJ, if he can stay healthy too, that's another one on my health list. Um, yeah. Because his back and all, everything was acting up with him the end of the season. I mean, he limped off the field every single he game. Just, he, <laughs> he's got to get in the... He got to get in the weight room. I mean, he's got all the talent in the world, but it's like he looks smaller than Christian Clark and Jared Gibson from day one from some of the pictures coming out of like off-season workouts. Like... Christian Clark and Jared Gibson both look like they've been in like strength training programs in college for five years. And CJ looks like he's still like a junior in high school, for, like compared to them at least. And so, I mean, I'm not trying to hate on CJ. I think that's just the case. Like you mentioned, I mean, he hurt his ribs game one, I think back injury. Yeah. Being able to take that contact. It's, it's only going to get more brutal this year playing in the sec playing against Michigan. You know, you got a 12 team playoff. If you make that, that's more games in the postseason. It's the best yeah. thing though. The the real quick. The best thing though about our backs, most pretty much all of them have hands. So yeah. you're not really giving the defense. You're not you're not giving you're not tilting the defense so to speak, 
if somebody, you know, there's certain teams or we've had times where certain so-and-so's in the backfield. He's there. We're not going to run a screen. He's not going to even run, you know, he's either pass pro or he's going to get the football. Right. And the fact that at least CJ, you know, was able to catch the football quite a bit last year. You know, we know what Jaden blue can do. You know, there's, we've been lining up Jaden blue in the slot, um, you know, in certain personnel packages, Trey Wisner can catch the football. You know, I don't know about the, the two young boys, but just those three, those first three alone, I like the fact that that ke- that can keep Sark honest with his play calling, regardless of who's in the game, um, without having to tilt things. That, that's that's always been a big deal for me with my running back room and the versatility there. It, I like that you mentioned that, Stephen, just because like I I. One of the things that wasn't covered a lot, I get, because I think he was from Florida, out-of-state recruitment, you know, usually SEC territory. Like, I remember I covered a few, like, camp setting seven-on-sevens for uh, for CJ Baxter a couple of years ago. And uh, he's really an underrated route runner. Like, he, he can, in seven-on-seven ball, you know, against some, like, faster linebackers, blue-chip defensive backs, like, he was holding his own out there, running crisp routes, looking at – he looked ahead of the curve from where you would see like a running back in seven on seven. And I knew he was still developing at the time and still learning. I mean, obviously last year learning Sark's offense as he went along, but like he was making, had some crazy highlight reel catches last year, one handed catches. So like, I, I mean, as a receiver, I think he could be really, really good. So yeah, I think that there's a lot that you can do with this backfield. And we're one of the highest usage screen teams in the country. So yeah. you got to catch the football if you play if you play for Sark and, and you know this 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 Texas offense. Was it last year or the year before where like five straight games our first play was a wide receiver screen? Last year. It was last yeah, year. Yeah, it was <laughs> so funny. And it might be even more this year cuz the positionless football we got and all the guys that are just like sub 11 second 100 yeah. meter guys like I mean wide receiver room, tight ends, I mean Nye Black you can get them out there too i yeah so i don't know we, we're gonna do that a lot i think and then what camp do you guys fall in i know like the fan base is kind of split on this but like if health aside who would you want to get the majority of reps at running back do you want blue or do you want baxter i think it depends on the game i mean you can game plan them different ways but i mean i i think things are trending Jaden blue right now just because of how physical of a runner he is but like i think if Baxter can stay healthy. Ultimately, the job could be his. I mean, the ceiling on his game's higher, and he's just a more natural fit in Sark's offense. Yeah, and Baxter can wear a defense down. I would, I would say, I don't think there's any recipe where it would look like a Bijan Roshan type split. I think it's going to be more of what we saw last season, right? With even with Baxter and Brooks. I think it's going to be something like that. Or, or And I think, honestly, it's going to look like a 60-40 type split like we saw in the Washington game where they were both pretty heavily featured. So, I, I mean, I don't know. And, and, again, you know, hot hand, favorable matchup. And I know Sark likes to have that bell cow. That's the thing. He's always really, you know, preferring. He, that's why he's always had a 1,000-yard back. I think every year he's called plays. But – People have thrown out there. Is there the possibility, which I don't, I don't know, but is there a possibility you have two thousand yard backs? You know, I mean, if somebody, if we start getting crazy, and let's say Jaden Blue averages six and a half yards per carry, or something like that, right? Where, you know, he's only carrying the ball 13, 15 times, but he's averaging ninety, hundred yards a game, right? That there could be the potential of that. So, I think it's gonna, it's an interesting dynamic though how it plays out, and ball security is gonna be paramount. I think we, if you look at the conversation in the lens of like total yards from scrimmage and, you know, if we're using these guys more as, as receiving threats, then I think easily we could get two guys with thousand yard seasons. I mean, I think we were close last season. I think Baxter had what, eight, seven, 800 yards. Um, All purpose. Yards. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a good point. Black Baxter towards the end did creep up there. Yeah. And so, I mean, and then you had blue who was, I think, close to 500 for the season just because of his elevated usage. And I mean, what do you have like 170 on 10 carries against tech or something? And so, I mean, it's, I think in the backfield, right? Like I, I think I look at it more as who like these running back, you know, I think it's an interesting point. I guess I'm going back a ways, but like, if you look at like 
who recruited these guys like char choice obviously a bang up running back recruiter and who he's brought in but like i think something that's overlooked a lot is you know baxter again more the natural fit in sark's offense jonathan brooks and jane blue were both recruited by stan drayton and both very talented great finds i mean well i say great find blue was the number what number one or two running back in the nation when he committed to texas a few years back and then he sat out his senior year and for some reason his stock dropped a lot which i think was a little unfair to him but um i mean i think like i think for Jaden blue and jonathan brooks it's just again these guys they're just such natural talented backs that you just got to get them the ball and you know they'll, they'll get the job done but yeah i think baxter you know, eventually Christian Clark, I think, can work into that mix. You can find ways to get him the ball. I think that he's coming along really well. But Wisner probably is your third back, I would imagine, just because he's got that he improved it on special teams last year, got some reps late in the season, and like it looks to be doing pretty good this spring, coming along pretty well. So yeah. you know who we uh we haven't mentioned is Savion. Yeah, the tank. Uh, yeah, <laughs> five you know, ten four. We're good. <laughs> but that wild red package, we ran it. Hey. And he threw, he he did a lot out of it. That package was a real thing for us last year. So, I, I mean, I can't ignore Savion in this case. I wonder how many reps he gets Saturday. I don't <laughs> want to like, have like a negative outlook on that. Like, but I, I want to see it. Like, obviously, I mean, he seems like a, like an awesome teammate, like in all seriousness, I think he seems like a, like a great guy to have in the program. I, I just, I don't know. I got to wonder with how much versatility he's shown and like the position movement, like, is he... I don't know. Is, it's hard to imagine he's in great cardio shape. <laughs> I, just, I mean, he that guy, he's like a freaking fire hydrant is what he looks like now. So, yeah, I, I would assume Sark just said, hey, beef up. We're going to be running that wildcat package down the red zone because we struggled there. Like, whatever we did last year, we got to change something up because we were in the 80s in the country points-wise in the red zone. I think if we have Neto in that, in that guard spot, that's going to help us. In those short, in those tight areas of the field, short yardage situation. Can I introduce a controversial opinion here? <laughs> this is also on Sark, and I, I don't, oh, yeah, I don't rag on him about too much, especially how the, the the progress we've made. But the red zone play calling has been at times trash. Okay, yeah. and starting with the formations, I'm not a big. To me, if you're going to be condensed down there, you got to be bullies. If you're if your offensive line are not bullies and you're going these jumbo packages, you know, 12, 13 personnel, all this type of stuff, then you need to be pushing people around. Your double teams have to be on point. If not, you gotta spread, you gotta get people out the box. You can't that's the only other way you can help your football team, to me. And then, you know, at least give the defense a thought that, hey, they might throw a slant, they might throw a fade, and then a handoff or something. But I just think that the way you know, and, and you know the bad taste in our mouth from the OU sequence of yeah. those four snaps down there, where it was just we got in our own way. I felt like it a couple times, but that's been a problem. I'm glad you brought that up because as good as we've been, I think the year before on short and fourth and short, third and short, we were that was a big issue for us. And the thing is, Quinn is not good at quarterback sneaks, so that's not even part of the offense. Right, so if he's getting under center, you know you take the defense doesn't even have to worry about certain things. So we have to. Hopefully, they fix that and they self scouted <laughs> because that 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 cost them a football game last year. The only time we've had a top half ranked red zone offense in terms of efficiency and scoring percentage was when we had Casey Thompson, Hudson Card, because they're I think a lot dual of threat already, ability, their dual threat yeah. ability to make throws on the run. And yeah, I mean, I don't think Quinn had, I mean, I think Quinn's getting better at that, but like, you know, the bit those runs that Quinn makes, cause he gets to the outside and he can use that. I mean, I'm a, I got long legs. I'm a guy that looks like I'm five, five sitting down six, two standing up. So I know what it like, I know what it's like to be able to like, like out there prancing like a deer, but he's got that yeah. side. And so it's easier to get to the outside. But if you see Quinn trying to move East to West, it's not pretty. And so, yeah, I mean, but I think he is he can run straight line and he had yeah. what five rushing touchdowns last year yeah. and most of them came before he got hurt. So when we did to your point, when we did call that zone read or, or whatever you want to call it, because it wasn't even quarterback power, it was basically him just reading the end and people were crashing because Quinn doesn't ever run. 
So he was he he had several walk in touchdowns. I just need that to be mixed in, right, to help with some of the problems. Well, even you said the the fade ball last year. I thought it been well. You have AD Mitchell and Jatavian Sanders. You got to throw some. Some of those have to be fade balls. Some of them, I'm, they're not high percentage throws, but you got two freak athletes at the positions. Go throw a couple fade balls at least if you're not hitting. And yeah, again too, like if you look back at Steve Sarkeesian's time in Atlanta. That's what worries me because he he got fired for that. They were not good in the red zone he was in in Atlanta. You can go back and look at it. They were like at best average in the NFL. Like he was great at moving the ball in between the twenties, but he for some reason he stalls down in in the red zone. So I'm hoping he can figure that out. He has proven to be um, less stubborn. I mean, the um, I forget what the game was where it was it was the Big Twelve Championship game where we showed a kick that field goal and he said that's my bad, my, my fault. I like that. Um, that come to terms moment with yourself and everything like that. So I'm hoping in the off season, he dove deep into that because if he can just be an average offense in the red zone, we went, we probably are, we probably beat Washington last year. Honestly, we had four cracks inside the 15 yard line with really good weapons. You got to get one of those in. Yeah. I think it's interesting too. When you look at like some of the best red zone offenses in college football, they're often, I guess this is more just like to the idea that like, a lot of these great like offensive minds really get stuffed in the red zone because this whole idea of taking advantage of space, yes. getting athletes the ball where they can make things happen after the catch. Like I think that a lot of that idea is diminished in those tight areas. And I think that's where you see a lot of these old school defensive coordinators really like to prove their chops and really like to be physical. And yeah, that's to the detriment of a guy like Steve Sarkeesian or to let's say like Lincoln Riley, when he's got the rare occasions when he's had like a pro style quarterback. And so I, was, he, I think he gets too cute too. like the Murphy and sweat things cool and everything like throwing them out there. Well, how about you run two extra offensive linemen out there that know how to block? Like you saw in the Oklahoma game there that there's touchdowns there. If one of them blocks, if one of them blocks, and I don't expect them to be able great blockers because they're not, at, they shouldn't be asked to do that. Do. Yeah, exactly. We're probably going to see a lot of Malik Ogbo if that's the case this year. I think kind of the that hybrid tight end role, but yeah, I mean, yeah, something I, I think he just needs to simplify it to start, especially when you're going to have as good of an offensive line as you have this year, because you're not again, you're not going to have that guy that you can chuck the ball up to on the outside. So you don't have that A.D. Mitchell cheat code like you did in the Washington game or the Houston game or whatever game. He made some awesome touchdown catch. And yeah, so, yeah, you know, Kyle Flood is also, the, the, uh, you know, how O-line coaches are. They take stuff like that personally. Yeah, and you know, he's going to be in his kid's ear, you know. They've probably I, I can only imagine how many times they've watched that OU tape. Even even as all the success they had after the fact, because it still comes down to, hey, those phone booth moments, those moments of truth, those 50-50 moments, we have to be better than our opponent. That's where Georgia never loses. That's where Michigan won a national championship last year, right? That those physical phone booth moments. And you I mean, even look at the super the NFL level, Kansas City and San Francisco, several times it came down to phone booth football. So, you know, you, you, you're going to be emphasizing that. Where I think the good news is for us as Texas fans is with Steve, Sar Steve Sarkeesian, he has shown me that he will make adjustments to himself. He had a problem with second half stuff coming into last season. And I watched him fix those things. I watched him be better at adjusting to his opponents or saving some of his script for later in the game or being quicker to adjust. And that was something that he struggled with the first two seasons at Texas. So if he can improve those things and show me that he can change his habits, then I think the red zone thing he can also change as well. Yeah, I think another thing he's going to have to do this year too, and I know he doesn't like to do that, as history has shown, is rotate wide receivers more. I think you have a – you may not have the top-end talent that you had with Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell, but you definitely have more depth than you have had in a very long time. I think there's six, seven guys that I'd be comfortable with seeing the field. So hopefully you can rotate, get these guys in, and give them chances. I just don't know how much last year you could afford to take Xavier yeah. Worthy and Adonai Mitchell off the field, whereas this year I don't know. I think Bond is going to be a good, you know, good guy to go to probably eight eight times, 10 times a game. But like, yeah, none of these guys, I think in the receiver core more so than maybe, you know, maybe your top three compared to the next three, there's not going to be as big of a drop off last year as compared to last year between your top three and your next three down on the depth chart. I think the roles last year were also a lot more determined, right? I mean, it was very clear 
A.D. Mitchell was your boundary guy. It was very clear Xavier Worthy was going to play to the field. It was very clear Jordan Whittington was at his best in the slot when we went 11 personnel. And, yeah, the bulk of the snaps, I didn't have a problem with how they did it. I agree with y'all. It's even, you know, the only time you really played with it was when, you know, Worthy started getting banged up a little bit. But other than that, I mean, yeah, you're going to roll with two guys that are potentially going to be first-round picks in a couple weeks. Right, so it makes sense, and that he, he he plays with it from a NFL standpoint there. But I agree, you gotta adjust to your personnel, and I think it'll be a, a advantage to Texas this season to play multiple guys just to give different looks to the defense, because we have a lot of guys with a lot of speed that are going to be better with the ball in their hands quicker. I want to see more RPO stuff this year, this year, just because that's the type of personnel we have. Right, I mean, I'm, I I don't have the, Ad Mitchell's not gonna bail me out on a on you know on the outside on a comeback route just out muscling somebody, but what I can bank on is you know some of the shallow cross stuff that Ohio State made real famous, getting somebody the ball on the move, and then maybe taking it to the house. I think we're gonna have a lot of those opportunities this year. Yeah. And I think we're going to see a lot. We might see a lot more man press coverage versus the wide receivers we have. Because I think our guys, with the speed and everything, agility and route running, I think we'll eat up zone. I think we'll absolutely eat up zone, especially with Sarge's offense. So I think, or especially later on in the season, we're going to see a lot more man. You don't think we're going to see any more of the three high shell? Any, I, I'm that? sure I'm sure someone will throw it at us. But I mean, I think Sark did a lot better job versus Iowa State and that defense last year. Just taking – I mean, you're, it's not going to be pretty, but we're going to grind out and get this win, and that's what it takes. You, it doesn't need to be pretty versus that defense. You just need to take what's given because they're going to give you throws. They're just not going to give you the throws you want to get. So take what's there, and he did that better um, last year. Hopefully, if someone does run it, we do it again, and he stays with it. Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, Quinn's ability to read bracket coverage, that jump year over year, you expected it to happen. But um, also, like, just in the SEC, you don't have that type of Gary Patterson or Iowa yeah. State three high influence that you do in the Big 12. And so that, I mean, that's going to be a thing of the past. But yeah, Sark kind of figured that out. I just want to see – I it it stresses me out when we – I get that some of the games like Kansas State last year, they're a good ball club. We had Malik Murphy. They started to figure things out. But, like, I – you know the TCU game, the Houston game, even with Quinn's injury, I, I, I you got to see them put the foot on their throats a little bit more. Um, get when you play a team like Mississippi State, a team like you know Kentucky, I think is a decent ball club, but like or will be this fall. But like when you play teams like that, if you get a double digit lead at halftime you got to be able to put them away because those are going to be the games that you got to win to get to that double digit win mark in the sec this year. Yeah. Honestly, if he didn't, if we didn't have the Texas tech game at the end of last year, he, that would be kind of like the last piece of the puzzle, but what he hasn't done, which is like, just step on someone's throat and destroy him. Like, like you said, the Kansas state game. I mean, that was the biggest tale of two hats that, that brought me back to the Tom Herman, Charlie strong era. I was like, what the hell are we doing? Just l- pulling your hair out because you have a game of control and then the only reason they're coming back is because of what you're doing to yourself. So I think that's the last um, key to this team is just when you do have a lead, when you're up 17 points, extended to 24 then extended to 31. And then if you want to hold on, hold on, but we just need to get past that like threshold of three to four scores. A lot of that's on the players too. Just there was a, there, for some reason there was a lack of execution on like key third downs in second halves last season. You know, you would see things like missed blocks, boundary wide receiver blocking has to be better this season more consistent i mean i don't <laughs> I, I i'm assuming that's a gripe on ad with the nfl draft scouting process but it I is mean, <laughs> it um worthy i think was decent there but you don't i mean your best blocking receiver has gone um like i think Moore is a solid blocker i think that golden actually graded out pretty well as a blocker at houston granted dana's offense you don't have to block a lot as a receiver um i think that yeah that that'll be a big thing this year. I just, I, I got to see more like third down execution in those, those key second half situations. Cause like, it, it's just so frustrating when you see like a receiver running maybe the wrong route or just in, you know, Quinn throwing 10 yards away from where he thought the receiver was going to be like that. That stuff can't happen this year. Well, if Quinn wants to make the leap from an NFL standpoint that we expect that his talent dictates and commands, he has to take ownership of the offense in that regard. 
that stuff where hey you know even summertime knowing that you have young group or and some of some young guys but also guys that are transferring in you know silas bolton's gonna be coming in over the summer taking them aside and saying look that comms is gonna be sharp now in august right and and the the you know some of those plays that got away now i'm older he should have a voice you know his voice started to come along but you know what you know what the intention is Sark talks about it with his quarterbacks because he's a quarterback trainer. He's like, I need you to get to the point where you understand the why of why, why, what we're trying to do on this play and the concept we're trying to execute. And if Quinn can get to that where he can command that on the field, I think that will at least eliminate some of the, you know, some of the, 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 the stuff that happens out there where they stall. Uh, that's my hope because that, that's what I would like to see if I'm an NFL scout. I know you can throw a pretty ball when the, when the pocket's clean. You know, I saw you at Pro Day. I know you can do that. But when things are muddy and, and guys may be a little flustered, can you pull somebody in and say, hey, I need you to be at 15 on that dig. No excuses, right? That's that's where I'll see true growth from, from, from QB1. Yeah, and he's got to be the voice in that room now. I mean, the, all the voices have left. There's no Roshan Johnson there. There's no Jordan Whittington there. Like, hey, this is your team. You got to step up. You got to lead them. And hopefully he can do that, like you said. I I had an interesting thought that came up for me actually earlier today. It's funny we're talking about like Quinn's development here. Like I so looking at the numbers last year, I I, I do a lot of data nerd stuff. Um, Quinn had it was about ninety. Pa- I think it was ninety passing attempts on ninety RPO passing attempts out of what three ninety. Yeah, about three hundred ninety passing attempts last season. So it puts him about a quarter. Do y'all think that goes over or under this year for like number of RPOs that, or I guess percentage of RPOs that sarcasm take? I think it would go over based on personnel. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing over based on personnel. And I, I mean, he does, I think he does pretty well in it too. So I don't know why you wouldn't run it more as well. Um, so I'm hoping we do see a little bit more. Yeah, I think he had the, he was top five in uh, the Big 12 and adjusted QBR um on rpos and that's including everyone i think if you include eligible passers he was second behind ironically rocco becked so <laughs> um yeah i mean i think that would i think that would he benefit came from him. a rpo based offense at south lake carroll that's that's yeah. the one thing i know he can read correctly yeah. no disrespect but like like the other stuff the other stuff has been that's funny. You know, advanced quarterback <laughs> training with Sark. But the one thing you should be able to read correctly, all the RP, they ran hell of RPO at South Lake Carroll. That's that RPO aired out. Offense. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we ran it earlier in the year and then we kind of got away from it as the year went on. I don't know if that's the way teams are playing us or if just Sark just wanted to go a different direction. But I also think, um, honestly, Mac Jones isn't the best quarterback that's ever played football, but that man ran that offense to perfection that's if i was steve sarkisian i'd be like here's the tape of mac jones 2020 season i want you to do that if he recreates that guess what you see what mac jones is in the nfl he's not that good but he ran that to a t that's why he was a heisman finalist that's why that team won the national championship and it was like flawless qb play so if that's a guy that um that's a guy i should say that quinn should be looking up to and how this offense should operate yeah i mean what i think that I think he, I think whenever Quinn did run RPOs pretty heavily late in the season, we were still operating it really well. Yeah, 103, one touchdown on 11 passing attempts against Texas Tech. Not that much against Oklahoma State, but yeah, I think, I think he'd be really effective in that. His short to intermediate accuracy naturally is elite. Yeah. yeah. When he throws screen, I know it sounds silly, but when he throws screens, he throws the screen where you're supposed to throw the screen. Or, you know, those RPOs, he throws a very catchable, you can take it and run after. If you get hit, he knows where to put the football. So that's something he's just naturally gifted at as well as the intermediate stuff. Um, You know, obviously, it was mentioned earlier, his footwork on the deeper stuff is where we really, you know, if he can make some big boy throws, then we're going to run the football. To the sidelines, the (laughs) sideline throws, Yeah. (laughs) Got it. Yeah, got to see it. Yeah, he he floats it a little bit too much. If he can just step in and drive, because he's got the arm strength, we've seen it. Just drive the football, 
you'll be fine. And I don't know if that's like an injury thing. He's scared of like playing that leg and throwing worry. Something's going to like, someone's going to hit him. I don't know, but that's like the last key to me is that. Yeah. He can throw them down the middle. Fine. He can throw those deep balls down the middle. Fine. It's the timing and that precision for you got to have to get that launch point down the sideline that, that for some reason it's, it's like whatever. pitching. You yeah. got to have a multitude of pitches. Right. And yeah. That's been the the one – some of the critique with Quinn is sometimes you just choose the wrong – because you have the arm. Like some guys, are, when you have a limited arm, you got limited pitches, right? It, you know, this yeah. is what it is. I, I got it there, right? But with, with Quinn, that, there's no excuse. No. Yeah. I mean, there's a perfect example of that. Like you said, limited guy, uh, Cole McCoy. He got the most out of what he had. He didn't have a great arm, but he was accurate and on time with everything he did. And if Quinn can do that with his arm strength, I mean, we're looking at a first round pick. Yeah. Hey, I, I got to get going here. Um, Mark, thanks for having me on. Uh, Steve and Matthew, it was fun talking with y'all. Um, yeah. Thank well, you. Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. Andrew. Appreciate yeah, you being you. here. Everybody, uh, lock in on Hook'em Headlines with Andrew. It's right there on the banner. Follow Andrew on Twitter there, Hook'em Headlines. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate Thank you, you being here, man. Thank you. Hook'em. All right, guys. Anything else before we wrap it up here? Well, it doesn't have to do with Texas, but uh, Stephen Antonio Brown. You know, I don't know if you remember that on Twitter. Yeah, we got in a debate, Mark. We um, he he thought oh, Antonio one. Brown. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, just over like NFL stuff. He said, and Antonio Brown was the fourth best wide receiver ever. I have him a little bit down the list, but. Um, it was fun actually meeting you in person. I've watched your channel. I think you do a great job. So guys, head over there and subscribe if you already aren't. Um, and I'm excited to watch the spring game this Saturday, Mark. Yeah, Stephen, uh, before we let you go, let everyone know what you got going on at uh, your channel. Absolutely. So thank you for having me on. Make sure you guys subscribe here as we, you know, the, the lift off of, of the Texas platform here. It's, it's, a, it's an honor to be on here. Uh, but Fanatic Perspective over on YouTube and IG, every other social media platform, you can find me talking Texas football, Cowboys football if you're an NFL fan, Spurs uh, basketball if you're a basketball fan. I also do a lot of college basketball content covering Texas as well. Um, just, you know, as the name says, a, fanat a, a, a fanatic out here giving their perspective, right? So um, excited for the spring as well and, and you know, looking to – as we touched on this roster, man, I'm looking to, to chop it up with you guys afterwards, right? You know, there is no off season. We're about to go into another portal season as, as you guys are seeing. So it's going to be a lot to discuss afterwards. And I'm excited to do it with you guys. Thanks for taking the time, Steven. We appreciate you being here, man. Thank Great you. stuff. This is what, uh, Matthew and myself will we'll be doing each and every Monday, folks, uh, here at the Voice of College Football. It's uh, Horns Huddle, 7 o'clock Eastern and uh, 6 Central. This is our first edition, our big kickoff launch party. We're revamping the Texas channels. There's some good work there by uh, Sonny Verma who's produced some segments there. I will as well. Matthew and myself again every Monday with all of you. So lock it in, subscribe to the Texas channel. You might be watching on the Texas channel. You might be watching on the national channel. And uh, we'd like to get as many people over there as possible, of course, because as you could hear tonight, we're going to slice it up. We're also going to uh, bring on some of the best that we can find talking Texas football. Yeah, and uh, we'll be here Saturday, too, after the spring game, Mark. So um, I'll be back for that. Awesome. And you actually get to see my set. My power went out, so I had to make plans, go somewhere else. But you will get to see my set uh, revamped. So wow. be there for that as well. Revamped set. I I'm I keep telling people I'm working on mine. Nobody's seeing anything, even though Amazon has uh, hit me for a few hundred bucks. So <laughs> that's 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 the indicator right there. So things things are happening here at some point. I got stuff laying all over the place. We'll we'll get it figured out. But uh, uh, we do have the content. Everyone, we'll we'll get the look down. But we've got the content for sure. Appreciate Matthew. I believe the games at uh, three Eastern. 
I believe so. It's either three Eastern or two thirty Eastern time. I know they like to be special. Um, I think it's going to be kind of hard to find though. I think it is going to be on Longhorn Network one last time. You know, one last ride on that really crappy network that no one can find. Um, there are some places you can find it. That's all I'm going to say. So if you want to watch it, go find it if you can. But I'll be here Saturday, discuss it afterwards, see what uh what happens at the spring game. Hopefully everyone comes out healthy. That's the number one thing as a Texas fan. You don't want to see any major injuries. Just want to see everybody healthy coming out of that game. So everyone be looking out for the uh, notification. Matthew will go live after the Texas spring game. So it should be 5, 530, something in that range on a Saturday. Awesome. Matthew, I'm looking forward to it. We're going to be here every Monday and I'm going to learn a lot about Texas football and uh, we're going to break it down every week. I appreciate it, Mark. Have a good night, everybody.